Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like, I'm Teresa Furr, Director of the Wake County Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, we're so excited to welcome you uh, to the 17th Annual Virtual Keeping the Farm Workshop this morning. Uh, we are ex very excited to bring you uh, these important updates and information from the experts on how to keep your farm and forest land in the family for generations to come. I'm excited to tell you that uh, we have an all-star lineup of presenters today with some great information. I hope that, that, that you will be able to take away a lot of answer your questions today and a lot of good information that can help you manage your farm and forest. After each presentation that we have this morning, um, you will have the opportunity uh, to ask questions. We ask that you put your questions in the chat or the comment box. We have staff monitoring the comments and questions, and we'll make sure to get those to the presenters. Of course, all the presentations this morning are being recorded, and, we, and they will also be placed on our Wake County Soil and Water website for anyone to watch at a later date. We will also be posting our contact information, and the presenters will be also posting their contact information. If you prefer to talk with someone, by email or by phone, or have any follow-up questions that you would like to be answered just one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you again for taking the time out of your day to attend our workshop and, and get the information that you need to protect your farm and forest. First up on our agenda this morning, we have our welcome remarks from the Wake County Board of Commissioners. This morning, we have our chairman, Dick Hutchinson, and Commissioner Vicki Adamson to welcome you to the virtual Keeping the Farm workshop this morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sig Hutchinson, Wake County Commissioner, and I'm so pleased to welcome you to the Keeping the Farm annual workshop. This is our 17th year. Now, you know all the work I've done over the last 20 years preserving open space, or if you don't, I'd love to tell you about it. We've done over six to seven bonds preserving over 7,000 acres of permanently protected open space. And we've done a lot around our nature preserves, nature preserves that used to be farms, but now uh, our nature preserves open to the public like Turnip Steep or Proctor Farm, which is now Sandy Pines, Robertson Mill Pond, or Williamson Preserve, which is a project with Triangle Land Conservancy. Uh, and many of you were raised right here in North Carolina. Now, I was not. I was raised in West Texas. Uh, I've been here for 38 years. I got here as quickly as I could. And when I rolled into North Carolina, in Raleigh, North Carolina, I knew I wanted to make a difference, which is what I've been doing now for 20 something years, helping you preserve your farms and open space, which is why we're having this conference today, is to talk about all the opportunities that you have, because we know there's a lot of pressure on you and your family as people knock on your door, call you on the phone, want to sell your land for development, which is fine too. But some of you understand the significance of agricultural uh, heritage and want to keep your land and agriculture, which we want to help you to do. And there's ways to do that. Conservation easements is one of those. Uh, working with land trusts like Triangle Land Conservancy, or helping you with by buying the development rights, then getting giving an easement so it stays permanently protected in open space. Most importantly, we understand how much you love the land. For some of you, it's been in your family for generations, you know, all the way back from a grant from the king. So from that standpoint, you understand how important it is for you and your family. And we understand how important it is to North Carolina and Wake County. So, so we appreciate you being here. Um, we want to make sure this is a great day and give you all the tools that you need to be able to keep the farm. And let me turn it over to my fellow commissioner, who's also a huge advocate of saving the farm, Commissioner Vicki Adams. Thanks so much. Thank you, Chair Hutchinson. Keeping the family farm really is a subject near and dear to my heart. I am so proud that we have a great lineup of topics this year. Wake County Tax Administration Office will present yearly updates on changes to the tax code. Jason Page 
from the law offices of Jason R. Page will speak about the ways to plan your estate and protect your farm from legal challenges. We will cover farm preservation and conservation options for your farm. I know some of you have recently inherited land and now find yourself owning the family farm for the first time. I'm sure you're feeling a variety of strong emotions, including excitement, pride, and probably more than a little bit of anxiety. I want you to know that Wake County is committed to helping you. Our board has adopted a goal to actively encourage the preservation of farmland in our county and our staff are here to help you. Looking beyond this workshop, I hope you will take advantage of all the people and resources we have to offer. I want to thank you for being here and I want to thank our staff and partners who have been planning for months to make this happen. Hopefully next year we will be in person. Thank you and enjoy this year's workshop. Thank you, commissioners, for that, that awesome welcome remark for everybody this morning. Um, next on our agenda, um, we will start off with our uh, Wake County Tax Administration updates. I believe we have uh, Chuck Willoughby and uh, Braxton Williford uh, with us this morning to give you the uh, uh, tax updates and information. Uh, this has been one of the most popular topics that we have, and I think they have been longstanding from the very first uh, Keeping the Farm Workshop. They have been um, with us. And so um, I welcome them this morning and, and their remarks. Hey, good morning. Uh, thank you, uh, Teresa. Um, yes, uh, Tax Administration is here with some updates for everyone. Um, my name is Braxton Wilford. I'm also here with Chuck Willoughby. Um, Chuck is our new exemption specialist. Um, I know some of you over the years have had a lot of contact with uh, Michelle Lord. And Michelle retired back in December, and Chuck, Chuck trained uh, under Michelle for, for a good while. And he's now uh, contact for anything PUV related, and he has um, put together uh, some nice slides uh, with a lot of updated information about a number of properties that have PUV. And uh, I'll turn it over to Chuck, and um, feel free to ask us any questions uh, if. Uh, if any come up at the end, we'll be uh, happy to answer them as well. Good morning. It's Nicole Kreiser from Wake County Tax Administration. Chuck, we can't hear you. Can you hear me? 
Fraction was just telling me. I guess the case on my on my tablet is blocking the mic. Yeah, we'll get there. This is draft on it. That's the right one then. Okay, so I guess I'll just start over with the uh, PUV guide here. Um, now we have some microphone issues. So uh, we'll talk about the um, present use value, how, how the value is determined, PUV requirements, and how to apply. So in the last nine years, from 2013, we had about 3,600 parcels in uh, PUV, and now we have about 3,300 parcels. So properties in PUV. Agriculture, we had 2,400 in 2013 and about 2,400 in 2022. Horticulture properties went from 109 to 105. Forestry went to a little over a thousand to about nine hundred, and total we had thirty six hundred to about thirty three hundred, which is a seven percent decrease in the number of PUV properties in the last nine years. So acreage in PUV, two thousand thirteen we had one hundred and nineteen thousand acres in PUV, and in twenty twenty two we have ninety six thousand 
which is about 19% decrease in, in acreage. So who determines the use value rates? Use value is determined by the use value advisory board under the supervision of the NC State University Agriculture Extension Service. And use value rates are grouped by soil types and then into soil classes. And there's a map here um, that shows the different soil classifications in Wake County. So the basic requirements for PUV, we have the size, ownership, and income, applications, and then we have PUV compliance review and deferred taxes. So the minimum size requirements, agriculture, there's a minimum of 10 acres in actual production for the three preceding years. And active production is actively engaged in the commercial production of growing uh, crops, plants, or animals. In horticulture, you'll need a minimum of five acres in actual production for the three preceding years. And forestry is 20 acres in actual production, actively engaged in the commercial growing of trees for the three preceding years. So some more information on size. Multiple contiguous parcels can be considered a qualifying tract. Parcels that are separated by a road are still considered contiguous. Land under improvements used in farming operations can be considered actual um, acreage in production. Home sites are not considered acreage in production. At least the minimum acreage required for each program must be in production every year. And non-contiguous parcels that do not have the minimum acreage or acres may qualify under the expansion of the existing unit exemption, as long as there is a qualifying parcel under exact same ownership. Land in another county can be the qualifying parcel as long as it is within 50 miles on a straight line from parcel to parcel. So the ownership requirements. For properties not in PUD, individuals must have owned the land for four, four full years preceding January 1st of the year the benefit is claimed or resided on the property as of January 1st. Business entities must have owned the land for four full years preceding January 1st of the year the benefit is claimed. For properties in present use value, exception to ownership requirement is if the property is in PUV at the date of transfer, the new owner can accept deferred tax liability as long as all other requirements are met on the parcel or another or has another qualifying parcel. So some additional information on ownership, the multiple parcels that make up a qualifying tract, they must all be in the exact same ownership. A transfer to a family LLC or family trust is considered a different ownership. Once a deed is recorded, it cannot be undone. Please contact our office for review pending ownership chain. All non-related members of a business entity must actively must be actively engaged in the farming or forestry operation. And if the land is leased to a farmer, it will not qualify. A family business entity may lease to a farmer. Only one member needs to be actively involved in the farming or forestry operation. And the primary business, the primary business of a business entity must be related to agriculture, horticulture, or forestry. So the income requirements. For agriculture and horticulture properties, it has to be an average of $1,000 gross income per year over a three-year period. And in forestry, there's no income requirement due to the long-term nature of growth, but owners must follow a written forestry management plan to ensure optimal growth. Um, some additional information on income. Agricultural income can come from either agricultural or horticultural products. Horticultural income comes from horticultural products only. Sweet potatoes uh, income can be used for both agriculture and horticulture. Products that are grown on the farm and consumed on the farm, uh, such as hay for your cattle or horses, can be counted as income. Income that is not acceptable is rental income from leasing land, stud fees, boarding fees, 
training or showing animals and hunting rights. So the applications, um, initial applications for properties that are not in PUV, the application period is January 1st through the 31st. Late file applications are accepted with good calls through December 31st. Application only needs to be filed once unless there's a change in the type of use or ownership. And ap application for continued use for properties in PUV on the date of transfer, the application period is 60 days from the date of transfer. Late file applications are accepted with good calls through December 31st. Application only needs to be filed once unless there is a change in the type of use or ownership and the new owner must accept liability of existing deferred taxes. So if purchasing a property in PUV and wanting to remain in PUV, uh, best thing to do is call our office and request the continued use application just before the transfer. You can fill it out and have it back to us within 60 days. Uh, let your attorney know that you want to keep the uh, property in PUV so that the deferred taxes do not need to be collected and make sure the seller's attorney also knows. Uh, the type and type of use, agriculture, horticulture, or forestry has to stay the same as it was when it transferred. If this is your only parcel in PUV, it must also meet size and income requirements. If this parcel is in addition to other parcels in PUV, it must be uh, in active production and forestry management plans. A copy of the forestry management plan needs to be submitted to the uh, Wake County Tax Administration. It does not need to be submitted with the application. So NC general statutes require assessors to review all, all parcels classified in PUV at least once every eight years to verify continued eligibility. The last reviews were done in 2017 and 18, and the next review should take place sometime between now and 2025. Individual reviews can be sent out on an as-needed basis. So deferred taxes. If property loses its eligibility, we are required to collect the deferred taxes for the current year plus three previous years. So if it loses eligibility between January 1st and June 30th, there will be three bills for the back years and the current bill will be billed in July for the full market value. If it's, if it's transferred between July 1st and December 31st, there'll be four deferred tax bills issued. Once billed, the back year deferred taxes are due and payable immediately and the current year is due by the following January 5th and interest accrues monthly on any outstanding balance. Um, DOT taking a PUV property. Uh, DOT is uh, constantly making changes into the amount taken. GIS must wait until the right-of-way slash highway deed is filed with the register of deeds. If DOT has not provided the map to GIS, the owner may submit a survey that has the surveyor seal and the amount of right-of-way taken. Once the right of way is split, the tax office will create deferred tax bills and a copy of those bills are sent to the owner and to the DOT division. The general statute state that the deferred taxes will be reimbursed. So if possible, you should pay the taxes and follow up with the DOT representative. And most important, please contact us before making any changes to your property. And you can call us at 919-856-5400 and ask for the appraiser. You can also email us at taxhelp at wakegov.com. And there's a lot of information online at our website. And here's our contact information. Uh, again, I'm Chuck Willoughby and 919-856-7116. And my email's there. And if anybody would like a copy of this presentation, you could just shoot me an email and I can email it over to you. And that is all I have for you. Thank you, Chuck and Braxton, um, for that great presentation. Um,
I wanted to see if we had any questions that have been put into the chat or comment section. If we've got staff that's taking a look at that, please let me know. I know it's a lot of information um, coming to you at one time, um, but it's, it's very important information as, as they um, as they told you. If um, once a deed is recorded, it's recorded. Um, so if you're, you're experiencing any ownership changes or have questions about that, it's really important to to reach out to us or the tax office to make sure you get your questions answered um, before um, something happens that 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 can't be reversed. Um, as you saw from his slides, um, deferred taxes. Once that eligibility is lost, um, the current tax year is due plus the three years. And in Wake County, as you know, with, with tax values and the value of land, um, it could be very detrimental um, to a lot of farm and forest landowners. So um, we wanna make sure that you're educated and that you have the right information um, when making these decisions for your family. Uh, thank you both for an excellent presentation. Um, and we look forward to, to working with you as well in, in future with, with any questions that our, our landowners may have. Um, do we have any questions currently? Teresa, I don't see any at the moment. Um, so I, we can probably go ahead and continue. Okay, thank you so much, Laura. I appreciate that. Uh, ne next on our agenda, um, we're, we're excited to welcome our Rector of Deeds in Wake County, uh, Tammy Bruner. Um, she was, I believe, sworn in on December 7th of 2020. This, I believe, is her first Keeping the Farm Workshop, Tammy. You can let, let me know if that's, if that's true. Um, but the Register of Deeds acts as a legal custodian um, for all land titles and land transaction documents in Wake County. So very fortunate to have her. This also has been um, a lot of great information from the Register of Deeds office to help protect our, our landowners as well in Wake County with what to do and what not to do. So welcome, Tammy, and to your first Keeping the Farm, and hopefully we'll be able to see you in person next year. So I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Good morning, thank you for uh, inviting me. And yes, this is my first entrance to this group. Y'all were kind enough to ask me last year to participate, but I was just completely honest with you and felt like you knew more about um, all of this than I did at the time. So let's see how much I've learned since December 7th of 2020. Um, let me pull up my presentation. That, of course, is not giving me a choice right now. One second. I'm so sorry. <clears throat> and just to be clear, my hair is not purple or blue. My hair is brown. It just somehow this is how this computer displays me. I'm not this cool in real life. Um, so to just talk a little bit about um, things you need to know about keeping your farm safe, about keeping um, uh, all your records straight, filing with the Register of Deeds office. We're going to walk through all of those things right now. Um, as you all know, the property values in Wake County are through the roof and it's affecting uh, many, many things in um, Wake County. It affects all landowners, all property owners, all business purchasers. And I wish that I could tell you exactly why this is happening, but I think the number one thing is because Wake County is uh, an amazing place to live. But the other part of it is we have amazing businesses moving into this county and the facts are that we have more births than we do deaths in this county. So population is growing constantly and not decreasing on the regular. Um, this, these numbers are based on our report that we put out at the end of each month. And the last time we ran this report was in February. At that time, the median real estate price was $378,000. That has gone up over $10,000 in the last month. But I want you to understand that that includes all businesses and farms and single family homes and apartment complexes. But know that the bulk of all of these sales happen in the blue bar, 90, 97% of these are single family homes. So it is pretty close to exactly what, um, what the cost of a median household is. The previous um, presenters talked a little bit about 
real estate and legal advice and also making sure that you get all of your questions answered because things can happen to you once you own a piece of property that you don't really um, expect. By law, the Register of Deeds Office is not able to give legal advice. So we recommend very highly that you seek counsel, that you reach out to an attorney if you are making any changes in any of your uh, property records. We can't actually do that for you. So examples of changes that happen once um, property is owned and what can affect a deed that you might not realize. I'm not going to read these out to you, but I'll explain a few things. Um, the interstate succession is if you don't have a will, the state will make a will for you. So please put together um, a will to protect yourself and your family. Um, the constructive trust, it involves fiduciary abuse, say that there is partial owner that is um, breaking the law or taking advantage of the money that's coming in. This can affect everybody that owns that property. So when there's more, more than one owner, a change in the interest of any of the owners affect everyone that owns a piece of that property. I don't know if y'all have been talked to about heirs property before, but heirs property, and I do want to read this very clearly, um, heirs property is land that is jointly owned by descendants of a deceased person whose estate was never handled in probate court and is passed down from generation to generation. These joint owners have the right to use the property, but none of them have a clear title. I want to be clear about this, that if you own a piece of land with five of your siblings and one of the siblings decides to do something with that deed, it affects all of you. Um, so open communication and clear rights of who owns what and how things will be managed is extremely important. So um, owning your property, some of the issues that come up, um, an arrangement made by one owner, like I keep saying, can affect everybody. So even new purchases need to be up to date contracts and deeds. And also understand that the Register of Deeds Office will register and file most anything. Um, it doesn't have to be one of the specific things that by law we are um, made to file, but if there is important information about who owns what and the rules about how these this property is going to be managed, file it with our office. Then it's there, it's on public record. Everyone always has access to it. It won't be lost in a box somewhere. Um, an arrangement made by an actual or apparent agent can be binding for everybody, even if the principal was did not authorize any transfers of power or land. Verbal leases can be very binding. It doesn't have to be written down and signed. Pay attention to all of the details. Owning and transfer or leasing your property, make sure you discuss with an attorney the advantages of papering the title, which means writing it all out and filing it with our office. Uh, you don't even have to come into our office. Most attorneys already do everything electronically. You just need to go into the attorney's office, make everything legal and file it with us. Uh, standing timber, timber and minerals are just like land and should be treated as such. Um, when you are making a, um, a deed or a lease, don't just find one online. Get an official one so that everything is clearly stated and it's not some random paragraph in there that has nothing to do with your land. Discuss with your attorney and your tax advisor whether it'd be advantageous to separate the land <clears throat> from whether it's farming or whether it's operational. Discuss with your attorney or tax advisor whether it would be advantageous to have property owned by a legal entity instead of individuals. <clears throat> Make sure that while it's fresh in your mind, you document all of the decisions about the land and the land ownership. 
be extremely mindful of joint ownership because remember, if one person makes a decision, it affects you, whether you were part of that decision making or not. Make sure that you have a plan uh, that will keep ownership uniform and straight in, in case someone else, someone in the property ownership passes away. Make sure you make all family and business arrangements and understandings about ownership and land in writing, not just verbal, make sure that it is in writing. And it's extremely important to make a will, which we talked about at the beginning of this um, presentation. The last one is document your family tree with certified copies, which also is found in our office. So you can get your birth, your marriage, your death certificates, kind of start putting together that family Bible that all of our grandparents had on their coffee table with all of their important documents in them. Make sure that you um, document everything and have it in writing and signed by attorney and filed with my office is really all I'm trying to say. Um, for title insurance, do it right at the pur purchase of all of the land. <clears throat> Obtain the title insurance. I'm not sure of an attorney that will do a closing for you without title insurance. The title insurance simply um, protects you from anything that the attorney didn't catch that you may have signed your life away to. This title insurance will protect you. This is insane, but in about 3.5% of real estate closings, no matter how many times these documents are gone over, something has to be changed after it's filed, which is an easy fix, which our office can do for you. But please pay attention to what the documents are that you're signing and the agreements that you've made with other folks that own the land with you. While it's been rare, it's certainly on the rise. Uh, criminals have been known to interfere with property by using fake documents. Also, not just uh, criminals do this. Well-intentioned people may do this, make mistakes, um, or give fall imp false impressions about who owns the land. Some of these um, common schemes that happen are they claim to be the new, new owner. All they have to do is collect rent or get a down payment. They also sometimes will use the property as collateral. And rental par parcels, vacant lots, and raw land can be good targets because the true owner may not be physically present. It is, it is away from where you see every day and rare that you actually go and check in. One of the services that the Register of Deeds office um, offers, if you go to our website, you will see a link here to um, Oh, this, sorry, I'm at the wrong place. We're going to talk about this first. This is where you can search your property. So go to the Wake County Register of Deeds website. I'm sure all of y'all are familiar with this. Make sure that you go in and search your name, your partner's name, anybody that owns this land with you, and see if everything is listed on our website correctly. You can also sign up for fraud alert to make sure that criminals don't steal your land or your property. This is also a link on our website. You can simply uh, go to our website, click on a link, sign up for it. And anytime anything happens to the property that you own, you will get um, an email from us telling us that somebody has done something where your property is concerned. Here's what the page looks like for you to uh, put in the grantor's name, the grantee's name, which it's really important that you go in and make sure that you look up and make sure that everything is straight on the property that you own. You can find any piece of property, who owns it, when they bought it, uh, their deeds will be within this search. Also the tax department, the real estate also offers this great service where you can go in and find out all of the information about your property and the good thing here is you can also find where all of your tax bills are. So you can claim all of that on your taxes that I'm hoping everybody is working on right now. Um, so I hope this was a little helpful. If there are any questions, I am here to answer them. If I can, if I went too fast, I apologize. I did not put my contact information in here, but it is tammy.bruner at wakegov.com.
okay. And that is it. Thank you, Tammy. Appreciate that. I, I did, did notice um, somebody made me aware that there is sort of a lag between our, our live streaming um, on Facebook and, and YouTube from, from the original. So I'll give a few minutes just in case somebody may have some, some questions. So um, I appreciate your information. It's always very welcome. Um, and we always get a lot of questions uh, in our office as well um, with, with uh, deeds and what to do and, and things like that. So along with the tax information as well, that's some of the more common themes more common questions that uh, we receive in our office when, when working with our landowners in Wake County. Uh, Lauren, do you see any um, questions from the previous presentation from the Tax Administration Office or for Tammy? No, I don't. I do not see any. Okay, thank you. If there is, if there is any, just please let me know and we'll, we'll take them up. We will have a, a short break uh, after the next uh, presenter. And so we can um, we can stop then and, and uh, be able to answer any of the questions anybody may have um, with that. So, and if you need Tammy's contact information again, please contact us. We'll have our information as well. Um, most of most of the first two presenters and information from the tax administration office and from the register of deeds, of course, is on weightgov.com um, as well on our weightgov. We have a great website with with all that information and contact information on there for all of our Wake County departments. So. Um, Next on our list uh, for presenters is Jason Page. He is an attorney, a board certified and a specialist in estate planning and probate law. Uh, Jason uh, graduated from NC State, go pack. Um, Jason worked as a procurement forester uh, for two uh, small timber companies. He later attended law school at Campbell University. Um, he helps clients across Eastern North Carolina with uh, problems in the areas of estate planning, administration, real estate, and business. Uh, Jason's a staple of our uh, keeping the farm workshop and has done an excellent job. I was actually working with a, a farm and forest land owner recently on a site visit and, and working on some things. And that person mentioned Jason Page by name uh, and saying what a great job he's done, saved him thousands of dollars um, and a lot of uh, wrong decision-making um, through his work coming to the Keeping the Farm workshop and the information that, that he got from Jason. So uh, just to know that we have, we have had a personal uh, testimony, Jason, from your presentation. So we're excited to welcome you back and, and uh, give us this information. So take it away. Can y'all hear me now? Yes, I can, Jason. Okay. All right. So I, I'm having trouble with my video, but I'm. I, can you see my screen? I yes, I can. Yep. And, okay. it, and it is now in presentation mode, so that, it's good. Looks good. Okay. Well, I can't get my video to work, but it, it will. We'll move on with the presentation, and um, y'all can. Uh, I guess you can see the picture there, but. You can log on my website if you want to see what it looked like. Um, I've, <clears throat> I know some of you from growing up in Wendell and going to East Wake High School, and I, I know a lot of people that attend this um, every year because I've done it for several years. And you'll see here that <clears throat> I, I put that I'm going to talk about estate planning issues for farmers and landowners, but I think it, it matters that we're talking about specifically in Wake County in 2022, be, because the location and the timing can make a huge difference. I will say that I've, I've listened to the first two presentations and I think I have uh, encountered every single issue that 
has been brought up so far. So I've, I've got a lot of experience working with, with forest landowners and uh, farmers, not only around Wake County, but also across mostly the eastern half of the state. I do want to say this is not supposed to be specifically about your situation. My goal is to give you some <clears throat> overarching issues to look at so that you will be able to uh, discuss this with your uh, professional advisors when you when you do your own estate planning. So the issues I want to talk about in general are <clears throat> Number one, what are your realistic goals for your property? And I think the word realistic matters there because sometimes we have ideas that just won't work. And then second, which is where I focus a lot of my efforts, is what could keep those goals from being realized? So when I, I help clients work through those potential problems, and then finally, how can we mitigate those risks? <clears throat> So initially, we're thinking about your goals. Obviously, preserving land as a working farm could be one goal, and it's often a goal. Uh, we have to, to evaluate what those costs are, and you'll hear about some conservation easements, and that, that can be an important tool. But another goal some people have is to wait for the right price to sell. And... That's not just here, that is every person who owns land near an intersection of a highway is thinking maybe one day they wanna put a gas station here. What is sort of unique to Wake County and areas like Wake County is the idea that I wanna preserve this land like it is until things get really crazy. And then if all of a sudden my land is worth more than anybody ever fathomed that it might be worth, then maybe I want to get out at that point. And that, it's hard to evaluate that. I've, I've seen that change over the years of wanting to keep it here forever to, oh my gosh, my land's worth $100,000 an acre. And you have to realistically think about that in a place like Wake County where things are changing. Keeping land in the family is a, <clears throat> a goal, particularly when it's been in the family for a long time. And then uh, like the ultimate goal for that is co-ownership by actively involved family members. So a lot, a lot of people have the idea that all the kids are going to, to care as much about the property as they do and that they're all going to get along and, and come to Thanksgiving together. And, you know, if you don't work at that and plan for it, then that's likely not to happen. So looking at here about are they realistic? sometimes we can just look at something and say, ah, that's just not going to work. And then, and then the second part of that is, are there things, if it will work, are there things that can get in the way? But how, how we, we first evaluate the goals, is it realistic? Do your children care about land? I have done multiple trusts and LLCs, family ownership uh, situations where the kids just don't care. Or maybe one of the three kids do. And you know, you can't make your 40 year old child start caring about the land that's been in your family for five generations. You know, by the time they're a certain age, whether that's going to happen. And, you know, I'm talking about children, but it doesn't have to be children. It could be any other beneficiaries or nieces or nephews or whoever. But oftentimes we're talking about family situations um, when we're dealing with, with um, you know, heirloom properties. So then <clears throat> this second one, will your land create a division with your children? And, and I think Andrew will probably talk about that more, but certainly it can. And there's lots of ways it can. And then a, a realistic goal for Wake County, again, a specific goal is that what happens when all of a sudden <clears throat> there are apartment buildings and shopping centers? And will that work with your property? It might if your property is large enough or if you and your adjoining owners have a like mind, it might not make sense to farm 10 acres of soybeans 
in the middle of a, you know, a city. So those are things that you have to consider as well. And then will the value of the land be an impediment? And again, that kind of relates back to children and division with children, but also it can mean taxes. And are there issues that um, are going to come up about the, the value of land that you didn't expect? If you think it's worth 200000 but it's all of a sudden worth a million, then that can create a lot of problems. So I'll, I'll go through a little bit of these problems in, in my next slide, which is you know, about <coughs> what can get in the way. And a lot of things is the answer. First, long-term care costs is something we always talk about. It won't matter what, hap what, what your children want to do with the land if they never get it. I haven't looked at long-term care costs lately. The average is in North Carolina, but I expect it somewhere around $100,000 a year for skilled nursing care, a little bit less for assisted living care. But for people, particularly people who have a large portion of their net worth of illiquid assets, long-term care can, can force the sale of property. And even when it doesn't force the sale of property, it can uh, leave properties in a position to where you can't implement the plans that you wanted. We do a lot of long-term care planning for these type of properties because of the importance of the property or the importance of the goal of keeping it in the family. In general, we don't like to use irrevocable type planning structures that um, it basically are giving it away. But if you create the rules that you want and then you give it away subject to those rules, and then wait the appropriate periods, then the properties would be protected from your long-term care. The problem with that is you can't undo it. If you can undo it, then that means you, you retain enough control that it will be accountable resource for your long-term care. So this is a big issue for people. And obviously you can buy life insurance that with long-term care riders or long-term care insurance, or if you have the funding, you can self pay for that. But it is something that everybody needs to look at. Substantial increase in value can, can create a lot of problems too because you may have thought you had an estate that was not taxable and all of a sudden it is. And then you have this issue of, well, where is the money for the estate tax going to come from? Or a more likely event in the era we have now with high estate tax exemptions is I did a plan leaving one child my farm because he or she really wanted it and I left everything else to the other child. But that was five years ago and now my property's worth five times what my money is. So how do we fix that? And then will that have permanent impacts on how the children get along? So this increase in value thing can be a problem. And let me go back and say this again. Um, on the increase in value and the, the problems with the children. I don't, I don't think I mentioned it earlier, but family harmony is something that, that pretty much everybody takes for granted. And <clears throat> assets left to certain people can create permanent problems that are unanticipated. And sometimes it's, it's uh, an issue of where the mediating force in the family was the mother or father. And when they're gone, the kids didn't really get along that well to begin with. And now they're listening to their spouses, not their parents. So even if you can overlook what your brother does, you probably can't overlook what your sister-in-law does. So there's a lot that goes into that that you have to think through. And, and another thing, particularly where, where values continue to increase is if I want to farm, I need to be prepared and, and, and it's left 50-50 to my brother and I. I need to be prepared to pay my brother fair market value. 
because that's what he's going to want if he doesn't want the farm. And that's almost never the case. The, the child who wants to sell wants fair market value or more. And the child who wants to keep it doesn't want to pay that much because it's family and there should be some credit for that. And uh, all kinds of issues come up with that. But these, you know, as long as you know what the values are and you can accommodate that, it's easier to do. But you, you almost have to evaluate every month, like the Richard Deeds just said. I mean, values are going up substantially right now. Taxes are another big deal. <clears throat> I don't know who Teresa was talking about earlier, but my guess is they were talking about a, a capital gains issue. So one thing you really don't want to do in a place like Wake County is you don't want to screw up and give your kids land with your $40,000 tax basis in it if the land's now worth $2 million. And I see it all the time. And this is an example where people try to go on, just like the, the Registrar D said earlier again, you can, I think Wake County has every deed that's ever been recorded on record, online. So you can, you can go in and find deeds, but you better pick the right one unless you understand the circumstances. You know, I, I use the example all the time of me doing the tile in my bathroom. I did a terrible job and I was willing to take the, the risk of that. And it took me five times as long as it should, but I, I kind of enjoyed it. And it's not so bad that I had to redo it. I wouldn't do that with my wiring because I don't want to burn my house down. So with something as simple as a deed, you can literally go online and copy the last one that was recorded, but it might not do what you wanted it to do. And sometimes that means you pay several hundred thousand dollars in capital gains taxes that you wouldn't have had to pay otherwise. So you have to look at taxes, um, <clears throat> and not just income taxes, there's transfer taxes as well. So the, the estate tax problem is something that I talked about last year, and not a lot has changed. I actually did go back and listen to that and make sure I didn't say anything that was dumb or completely wrong, and, and I, I don't think I did. The takeaway is we just don't know what's going to happen. But if, ex if state tax exemptions keep going down while a state tax, uh, while values keep going up, it, at some point they collide. And, and you have to know what your plan's gonna be when that happens. <clears throat> Another issue is surviving spouse's remarriage. If you've been married for 40 years and everybody comes into my office saying, I wanna leave everything to my spouse. Well, not everybody, but most everybody. And then the question is always, well, what if you're remarried? Well, that's not going to happen. And then it does. And then what if your spouse dies before the, the new spouse? And then what if they've been married for 10 years and the, the new spouse is entitled to, after 10 years, I believe it's uh, 33 and a third percent. Even if you leave everything to your kids from the first marriage, the new spouse can step in and get an elective share. So you have to think through all that. And, and you really have to think through it in second marriages. So we do a lot of this planning because I've been through the elective share proceedings and the trust administrations, and I've seen the stuff just disappear before. We don't want to let that happen generally. And at least we want to know that you're taking that risk. One of the things I always tell my clients is, I want to make sure you know what the risks are. And then if you don't care, that's fine. But what we can't do is just assume that they aren't really risks. <clears throat> and then looking at, at this, a, a child's um, divorce, lawsuits, creditors, their own long-term care, their exploitation, the list could go on. A, a, an abusive marriage, a, a domineering spouse, a child who tries to manipulate, all kinds of things can happen. All of a sudden, your, your spouse's business is about to go out of business and they, and they want you to use the farm as collateral to borrow money to, to keep it afloat. Um, there's just so many things that can happen and we really don't do a very good job of evaluating risk. I've had lots of clients that come in with children who have already been divorced, who are not concerned about a child's divorce. 
40% plus of first marriages end in divorce. And then the, the numbers go up higher than that for subsequent marriages. And I literally have people more concerned about being bit by a shark than I do about their kids getting divorced and their, and their family land being lost because of it. And again, it's happened repeatedly that I've had to help work through those scenarios. Bad decisions is another problem. And <clears throat> a lot of times that's not just have a, a child who just has made a wrong turn every, uh, at every option in life. It's, it's children who are all of a sudden tasked with making decisions that they've never had to make before and they don't know who to rely on or don't want to pay for the advice or don't completely understand everything. And that's, that's true of all ages, but it's particularly true of younger ages. <clears throat> so we walk through a lot of times with clients the, the issues that can develop when a, a child with uh, less life experience all of a sudden becomes in charge of things. And you cannot, uh, com you cannot confuse intelligence with wisdom and experience there. Um, you think about what a, what a uh, experienced professional or even a, a trade the way they got that experience was doing it over and over and over again and seeing how not to do it and, and seeing what worked. And you think about um, algorithms and error correction. A computer can take decades of error correction and, and do it in a few minutes to come up with the right decisions. <clears throat> and if you're trying to build leadership, you go through... Uh, book learning to an, an apprenticeship type uh, situation or, or uh, of supervision from someone and then opportunity and then failure and then doing it again and again. And that's great, but you don't want that to be, I lost the farm that was in the family for five generations because that was my time to make decisions and I made a bad one. So we often talk about how to uh, do that over time and how, how to build in responsibility. And particularly with younger children, we'll say there's some age, we don't want you making decisions at all. Focus on finishing school or, or establishing yourself in your job or whatever it is. And then a lot of times we'll say, we want you to make decisions with someone else for a little while. So you learn to deal with the uh, accountant and the financial advisor and maybe the consulting forester and the lawyer and all those things. And then over time, after a certain age or a certain number of years, you take it over. So that that's a, a important part. And I'm, I'm getting into to kind of my ideas about mitigating risk now. <clears throat> Obviously, long-term care planning, which we talked about, <clears throat> a realistic understanding of value. Liquidity is important. It can, it can solve, money can solve some problems. It creates a lot as well, but um, it, it can create, it can fix a lot of these issues with, with land that we don't anticipate. And I have a lot of clients, particularly people who are actively farming, who don't value liquidity a lot. If they find a nickel under the couch cushion, they buy a piece of equipment or they buy another piece of land. and Having cash to uh, equal out things or, or uh, maybe not equal, but you know you have to talk about equal versus equitable, but some kids just want money. And the way we can deal with that and keep the land in the family is give the land to the kid who wants the land. But you have to have the liquidity to give the money to somebody else. So that's something that you have to evaluate. Tax planning obviously is important and the flexibility that you need right now for land is, is hard. It's easy to plan an estate for someone who doesn't have anything. It's actually not conceptually that difficult to plan 
an estate for somebody with 30 or $40 million. We kind of know the tools you need because you know what the taxes are going to be. It's not that I, not that I want to do it or that it's going to be easy to accomplish, but we at least know what the landscape looks like. But if you have an estate that's somewhere between, you know, four or five million dollars now and let's say 10 or 12, and then you're, you might live 30 more years. We don't know what's going to happen. We do know that exemptions are going down in 2026 unless something changes. And we know that that values have gone up substantially recently and seem to be on a long term trend that way for land. So remarriage protection, fortunately, a lot of this stuff can be done together. So we can, when we plan for taxes, it often plans for remarriage. If we plan for remarriage, it often has some tax planning and um, features as well. But remarriage protection, you know, the, the, the options usually are do a lot of planning or cross your fingers and hope that it worked out okay. And sometimes, I would say maybe even a majority of times crossing your fingers is the, is the right answer or at least an acceptable answer. But it's probably not if you're in a second marriage and, and this property has been in your family for four generations and you want to be certain that it goes to your children. Um, you really got to think that through. Choice of fiduciaries is important. I, I'm a fan of corporate fiduciaries in a lot of situations they aren't typically the greatest choice for family properties. So you have to think about all those issues I talked about earlier with who should be in charge and how to phase all that in. And does some, this person share your uh, goals for the property? Are they going to make the kind of decisions that you would make? And, you know, I'm talking about after death, but I, I hadn't mentioned early, uh, earlier um, incapacity is also an issue. So when you, if you do end up in the nursing home for 10 years, somebody's got to manage that property. And it needs to be someone that thinks like you to some extent, unless you, if you care about it. So then the last thing I focus on is flexibility. This is particularly the case when it comes to tax planning, because we, we want to step up in basis if we can get it. But then in some situations, maybe we don't so worried about paying a, a 15 or 20 percent capital gains tax if the alternative is paying a 40 percent estate tax. So I'll be glad to answer any questions. I know I went through things pretty fast, but I, what I, my goal was to give you a set of, of issues to work through in case you... Um, are sitting down with your other with your professional advisors to go through these issues and don't assume they're not going to happen to you is, is one thing I would say because I see them all, all the things I talked about all the things that the tax office talked about all the things that the registered deeds talked about I see them happen all the time. Thank you, Jason. Like great presentation as well. I'll give it just a few <clears> minutes. Um, I know we have a little bit of delay from from Facebook and YouTube to see if there happen to be any questions at all. In the chat. <laughs> a lot of good information, a lot of different um, scenarios and uh, information as far as issues that could could face the the farm and, and forest landowners as well. So not only here in Wake County, but I can see this across the state as well. So um, thank you for that. Just let me know, Lauren, if you if you see anything. We did have one a um, little bit older question, uh, just from Johnny Bowden, asking if the slides will be available. Um, and I can say, yes, they will be. So feel free to uh, let us know here in the office, and we're happy to share those with you. Absolutely. I'll just remind everybody now that, that all the presentations um, we will have available on our website, um, Soil and Water website, we'll, we'll give, hopefully give you that link toward the end of where to go to um, with our website. Um, so all the presentations will be on there and all the contact information as well. We have a, um, 
we've developed a comprehensive contact list of resource professionals um, with their email and phone numbers um, for every every presenter that's here today, um, plus some additional ones as well. Um, so um, we'll have that contact list on our website as well. And if you need that, we can email that to you. Um, but um, we're, we're glad to bring you these resource professionals and these experts in, in their fields um, to be able to field these questions and to uh, talk with you. And we understand that, that some of your questions, um, you may want to talk with somebody directly and that, that is great. And we will, um, we will certainly be happy to speak with you and or put, put you in contact with that professional um, for those questions that we get them answered. So. Teresa, we did have one more question come in too um, from Joni again um, for Jason. She wanted a little clarification, I think, on the uh, statement about remarriage after 10 years and the second spouse being uh, potentially eligible for a third of the estate. I think she's just curious about that or one more clarification. Yeah, I'll be glad to, to talk generally about that. There's, there's uh, certain protections that you're entitled to as a result of your marriage in North Carolina, and unless you have waived them in a valid premarital or postmarital agreement. And one is, for instance, a, a year's allowance. So at, at this point, if you're married, even if your spouse leaves everything to someone else, you're entitled to the $60,000 worth of personal property. So that's just an example of one of the, the marital rights, and, and they're often referred to as inchoate marital rights. So think of inchoate as they're not really there yet, but they're standing around the bin waiting to jump in place in case you need them. This is why when, when you own property and you sell it, even if your spouse has nothing to do with the property, then they have to sign the deed to waive their rights unless there's a, mar a premarital or postmarital agreement recorded with the registered deeds in that county. And so <clears throat> actually it may not have to be in that county, but it has to be recorded somewhere. Um, the, what I was mentioning earlier is the elective share. So on the day you get married, you're entitled to 15% of your spouse's total net assets if your spouse dies. And what makes this a little more confusing than it, than it uh, probably should be is that <clears throat> these are completely uh, unrelated to divorce laws. So a lot of people know that there's equitable distribution and there's separate property and equitable distribution. So if I inherit a farm and I get divorced, my spouse is not entitled to any of that. That's not true if I die. Um, the elective share is, is that your spouse is entitled to a certain percentage of your, of your total net assets. And total net assets is a, is a lot more than you might think. It, it, it would include things like IRAs and, and life insurance policies that you have incidents of ownership in. It would include um, things that you've given away over the last year of your life that your spouse didn't agree to. So the, the percentage that I used was the, the amount from years 10 to 15. So it starts out year zero to five, it's 15%. Year five to 10, it's 25%. 10 to 15, it's 33 and a third. And then after 15, it's 50%. So if I have a farm worth $4 million and that's all I own, and I leave it to my children, but I die before my second spouse, then if she wants to, all she has to do is go file a petition for an elective share and assuming I didn't have anything else. Kids are gonna to have to come up with a way to pay her $2 million if we've been married for more than 15 years. So it is a significant issue. And we actually had a case that came down last November with the North Carolina Court of Appeals interpreting that statute under some specific scenarios. So there are ways to get around it. One of those ways is to leave at least the, the elective share percentage to a trust that meets certain criteria. And, and the issue in that case was, did the trust meet this criteria or not? So 
it's something you have to work through when you have substantial assets. Now, if you, you know, if you're going to leave your 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 spouse a million dollar life insurance policy and that's all you have other than your million dollar land and you're going to leave that to your kids, that's fine. But you need to know those things and they're, you know, it's kind of like the long-term care problem. A lot of people don't realize that when when their parents get on Medicaid and the the state and federal government pay you know, $150,000 for uh, medical care over the last few years, there's a lien on the, on the estate for that amount. So I've had many, many times people come into my office and say, what do you mean I have to sell the house to pay this back? The will says it was left to me. Same thing with the elective share. What do you mean my stepfather gets some of this? This was my mom's money and she left it to us. And I've had to have clients write six figure checks several times to a step parent. And I've had to fight for the surviving spouse to get their share. So it, they're, they're, this is just an example of things that are probably more complicated than most people think. And so it's something you have to think through. And, and a lot of times we'll say, these are the issues. Here's how you solve the problem. Now, which is worse, the potential problem or, or the known problems that will incur when we fix it? And sometimes it's not an easy decision. So again, I probably, probably gave more information than can be processed in a short amount of time, but I mean, literally trying to take 17 years of, of, of experience and put it in 20 minutes here. So um, I'm trying to hit the highlights, but it is an issue. I mean, the fact that somebody asked the question means I accomplished the goal here, making sure you bring it up when you're doing your own plan. Thank you, Jason. That's excellent uh, information and um, elaboration on that. So like you said, it, it can be complicated, but it's better to ask those questions and and um, figure out what what may happen, um, you know, now before it does happen. So <clears throat> good advice from, from Jason. So any other questions that you see, Lauren? Not at this time, no. Okay, thank you. We don't have any other questions. This is our scheduled uh, two minute break uh, to anybody who wants to take a few minutes to, to break away from the computer. Um, and then we'll, we'll start back up and just, uh, you know, say five to 10 minutes um, with our next presenter. Um, Andrew Brandon from NC State Extension will be our, our next presenter. So we'll, we'll just take a few minutes breaks and, and we'll, we'll come right back. Thank you.
Ready to welcome everybody back to the Keeping the Farm virtual workshop. I think we got everybody back on. Next up on our agenda this morning, Andrew Brannon. He is uh, serves as assistant extension professor with the Agriculture and Resource Economics Department in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences with North Carolina State University. He is a lawyer who concentrates in agriculture, real property, and natural resource law with a focus on farm and land succession. So um, he is going to talk about inherited a farm, land use, and co-ownership agreement. So Andrew, I will let you take it away. Can I share my video or screen or how do I see here? Yes, you would go ahead and share your screen and video. I can hear you fine, Andrew. All right. All right. Yeah, video is disconnected, so I'll just uh, I'll just talk. Um, hey, so <clears throat> I, I appreciate you all inviting me to come back um, to keep the farm. Uh, I think it's a it's a program that that at my role in extension, and I'll explain that in a sec, um, that I've been working with some other folks to try to emulate it across the state. It's just such a good program to hear the real nuts and bolts of land ownership and the program in Wake County. Those of y'all who've been participating in it know it's had real staying power. Um, so my role today, I, I have a library page up here, but I was gonna go in and just show y'all based my resource page that I manage. Um, in my role, uh, I'm an uh, assistant extension professor in Department of Ag and Resource Economics. Um, and I came to NC State, I guess I've been there about now four and a half, five years, uh, it was 2018. Um, and I, I came off a decade of private practice, um, uh, doing work in you know, farmers and landowners across the state. And the opportunity at NC State came up and I said, well, I'm gonna maybe start uh, work at trying to maybe explain a lot of, take my hand at explaining some of this stuff. Um, and so the, my web portal, if, uh, if you just will, you know, Google farm law and um, NCSU, I think it, I mean, it's going to come up on mine because I get to it all the time, but, um, but you'll see it pop up. I'm bringing this up here because I have my presentation embedded in here. Um, and, and so this, uh, this is the resource page that I, I, I manage um, and just try to cover uh things that are coming along um issues that come to me through uh cooperative extension statewide um <clears throat> you know a lot of you know land disputes and family issues about land succession and things like that i've been doing a lot more uh focus on uh what i call water work um, particularly out east um on solar development things like that but but really you know any of the topics that we're talking here today um, there's probably something here, uh, that hopefully a narrative that that might ex explain it out. And so, um, you know, I encourage you to visit the page and 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 search for whatever you're looking for. The presentation I put together today is, I believe, I'm gonna I have I'm gonna have it here under um, land use law, uh, just because this is where I parked it, but it could be anywhere. But you'll see there's articles here um, summarizing a lot of the stuff that I'm I'll you know that I'll have slides about. Um, some uh, some a lot of it still works in progress, and that's sort of what I'm finding out in academia is um, is is you, know, you you do work on these papers over time and and, and with peer review input and things like that. Um, but I titled today's presentation "Land Use and Co-Ownership Agreements" um, <clears throat> because this is one of the 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 um, the title that Teresa just said about, you know, so you inherited a farm. I want to, I want to actually point that out to y'all first, just so you're aware of this research source. This was something that I put together on a, um, a grant from the North Carolina Tobacco Trust Fund Commission. And um, again, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a handbook of mostly draft articles on a lot of different topics on, on Will's Trust, present use value, but it's very much focused on you know, the co-tenancy situations and what happens when you have land with siblings. It, it really, can, it's, I think it's helpful to anybody with land, but um, I'm trying to address that specific situation of, you know, how do you come to agreement or at least what the tools are for, um, for memorializing uh, agreements on land use in writing. 
And um, if I can just pull it up, this is it. Uh, if, if we had been live, I might have had printed copies to hand it out. Um, but here's a PDF copy, and um, I might refer back to it uh, as we as we go forward, just because to de de demonstrate some of the things that I'm talking about. Um, so going back into the presentation. Uh, Yeah, so um, land use and co-ownership agreements. So um, I want to, you know, echo a lot of what, or, you know, J echo Jason. I thought he did a great job of distilling his experience down into that small amount of time. Um, he said something that I, I did want to emphasize. Uh, uh, and one of the challenges with, with being in private practice and, and having left, I still get uh, little bits and pieces of things that have gone on in families over the years um, as, as we've both moved on, um, but still the long-term outcome of use of, of agreements and, you know, what the family had planned to do or what actually happened, um, that's, you know, there's not a lot of convenient research to be done on that. It's a really, it's a, to me, it's an interesting topic because when you're doing estate planning, you're planning as best you can for, you um, for you know many many contingencies, but at the same time not you know not trying to tie the hands of of your wealth uh, too much. And so I want to echo that comment that Jason made about you know be very very careful about um, the legacies you create or the demands uh, or I'm phrasing it differently, but the demands that you might place on the next generation to preserve your legacy because not it's unless um, a lot of work has gone into that while you're alive. Um, it's deuce difficult to get folks interested in it um, and uh, protecting those assets that uh, under your vision for doing so once you're gone. And so uh, um, I always caution, be very, very careful about creating um, legacy obligations. I think it be, can be very tough on families um, uh, when you have siblings that are trying to protect the, the vision of their parent um, and you have others that are like, uh, look, you know, we, we sort of need to move on. Um, and so, and I, the other thing I would say um, is that, you know, what you can do, and this is an, uh, echoing a comment, uh, similar comment Jason made, what you can do or what you want to do, or, you know, see the outcome, you can have it planned. You can put it to paper. You have to put it to paper. Um, but, you know, it's really up to your advisor to caution you on whether it can be done or should be done. Um, and, and so, but again, at the end of the day, it's up to you to, you know, take that advice and, and, and move on with it. So. Um, but on campus, I teach uh, two courses, agriculture law, and um, uh, uh, that focuses on a lot of you know, state law, common law issues, and then a course in environmental law. Um, and so um, I, I'm trying to, I track issues with extension and try to apply them in those classes. And I, I always, in my, when I do property law, I throw this up to the students and I'm you know, being a little philosophical with y'all. Um, you know, this is all stuff we just made up over the course of, I don't know, a thousand years, um, because, you know, in earlier times, possession of land was, you know, pretty much how, um, how land was uh, um, uh, uh, changed hands. Um, but as we developed our system of laws, you can put it on a piece of paper and, uh, you know, all your property right carries with it um, the ability to transfer that property right uh, in most cases. So, um, but regarding property rights, again, always remember um, that you're dealing with a bunch of severable interest anytime you're dealing with land. Um, you've got timber, wa you know, water, water rights are not as big of an issue here. Um, I think we worry more about getting rid of water than, than acquiring it. Um, but uh, creating farm tenancies on the land, um, allowing land use, whether that's hunting, whatever it happens to be, um, the rights are always severable, um, but in, to, to transfer an enforceable right, you're going to have to have agreement of all of the co-owners of the property if you find yourself in that situation. Um, just a review of title to states and land. Um, the one that, that, that I think we're dealing with, we deal with most uh, is going to be tenancy in common. That is when you do, uh, in, you inherit land, share and share alike with siblings. Um, and that's, I would say it's probably the most common, uh, you know, form of land ownership, uh, just how land has changed hands. I mean, a lot of folks are doing more and more um, good estate planning and being careful, taking care about directing assets to certain um, uh, uh, 
children, heirs, beneficiaries, uh, but a lot of um, older instruments that might have been drafted and executed earlier on in folks' lives that just divide up assets equally are going to um, uh, create co-tenancy interests among those that inherit those interests. Um, and so the, the challenge is, and this may have been brought up earlier, that as y'all know, um, uh, is that the, uh, the having uh, co-tenancy rights and property carries with it a right to partition. Um, and so I, I always say to myself, and there's no numbers for it, but I, I would imagine 99% of family situations just work themselves out by easy agreement. Um, and so, but there are a number of situations out there that where the families aren't going to be able to agree, um, particularly on, you know, buying out somebody's interest if they want to hold on to the land, what the price is going to be and things like that. Um, and so it's not... I don't think in vogue to use the word nuclear option <laughs> these days, but uh, this is this is sort of it. A tenant in common that's inherited an interest in land has this right under state law to pursue a, a partition action. And the the part the when when one of these actions is initiated, it's going to be um, it's not discretionary on the part of the clerk of court whether to do it or not. Um, it's a process that's initiated and it plays itself out. Um, and so the preference in law is for uh, actual division of the land um, when it's determined that uh, that cannot be fairly done without really damaging the interest to all the properties or several of the of the co-tenants um, rights in the properties, uh, the clerk might order a sale. So in a lot of the planning that we're doing and talking about co-ownership agreements and, and, and you know, even in your, well, I would say, especially in your estate planning, um, uh, in a way, this is what you're, you're, if you're trying to preserve family land or, um, again, create a, I guess let's call it a working, a feasible working legacy, then um, uh, this is what you're battling against. And so um, uh, um, trying to come up with an arrangement among the people that are going to co-own this property or that currently co-own the property um, to avoid um, this alternative is, um, in my view, the, the, um, the goal of your planning. Um, the, uh, d just a couple of reminders. One thing that's, uh, I think everybody knows is that you can't promise verbally, um, a right in property. You can't promise somebody that this is going to be yours, or, you know, I promise you that you'll be able to build your house over on that side of the land, um, or the farm. Um, uh, everything conveying a property right must be in writing. And, um, I've, I've noted the statute or the some of the the, um, the exceptions to that, but they're not ones that we normally, you know, think or other than the, than the verbal farm tenancy, uh, the adverse possession and things like that um, are not ones that we contemplate in our in our planning. Uh, those are just really um, uh, claims of rights that, that occur over uh, several decades. Uh, I'll talk about verbal farm tenancies here in just a second. Um, uh, Life estates still very common use of transferring interests. Um, I've, I've, I've always, or my, my practice preference when we're uh, dealing with open land, farmland, timberland, was to uh, generally avoid it, um, to use uh, trust or um, uh, will or trust to, to transfer those interests. Um, uh, the most impressionable issues that I dealt with usually involve timber. A lot of our life estate law comes out of timber disputes. Um, and so uh, it's, it's very easy to create a life estate. Just know that once you do it, it cannot be undone. Um, uh, I've been in several situations where uh, um, the remainder interest, the people that the land was deeded to or the person the land was deeded to um, would not allow the life tenant to um, to, uh, to cut the timber. Now there's a, the, I, I just mentioned the partition process. That's something that can be done. Um, and, and it is done. Uh, but for, uh, if you're transferring timber land in a life estate, I put the tip down, you know, reserve your timber life rights. Um, so you don't have a, a, um, a, a challenge and, and go ahead and pulling down that, um, uh, that resource. Um, uh, a little bit, I've been, uh, in that work, in that handbook that I, I spoke about uh, is an article. And actually this, there's one I have on, um, 
on uh, on the website too. I'll point out uh, this is an issue that I get a lot um, after um, uh, the, uh, about really the status of, of a farmer that's farming the land but doesn't have a written lease agreement. Um, and I, it's the law is difficult to to discern, and sometimes uh, I do get the call. Um, this would be from absentee landowners, things like that. To, to, sometimes they discover that um, that a, a producer that had permission to be on their land from a, a parent has remained on that land. Um, and so uh, I put together this uh, this article on verbal farm tenancies to try to you know sort through some of that. Very common scenario is you know the yeah the the the, the owner who gave permission uh, to the farmer to farm that land has died. Um, just as a, 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 a w- the way I read the, the statute and the law is that, you know, once the person who's given you permission is no longer owns the land, you do not have an automatically renewing, um, uh, or you do not have a, an, an estate that can be automatically renewed unless it's terminated. That's, that's one of the issues that if you're, um, if you have some, if you're farming land if, as a producer, um, on just a handshake, the landowner told you you could come on and farm it that year. Um, uh, uh, your tenancy, you know, again, if it was challenged and if you were able to establish that it was indeed, you know, for the year is protected by statute. Um, and there's notice requirements and and uh, really two categories of counties. Uh, tenancies uh, last um, in most counties um, from January one to January one. And under regular um, uh, just landlord tenant law, you have for a, a annual uh, agreement, there has to be a 30 days termination. So if this is uh, if you're making a change and uh, contemplate making a change in the land, um, this is something that you, you actually have to do. I was asked by actually a county to uh, to do a termination letter. And so I did it. So I put a sample on the website. Um, just know there's some counties that have a different different date. Um, that you have to uh, provide notice 30 days before. Uh, but Wake, Wake County is, my, just read the statute yesterday, is January 1, January 1. So, um, uh, but again, I just want to emphasize that, uh, it, that it's a real challenge that if, the, um, if someone has stayed on the land, then, um, and the owner has passed, uh, um, you know, the decisions that have to go into uh, telling that person, hey, you know, you can't farm this year, um, whatnot. I've, I think that they don't have as much of a leg to stand on if the owner has passed that had given them permission, because um, at that point, they're not even a holdover tenant. They're just um, uh, they're just continuing to use that land really without a, um, a verbal permission. Uh, but another issue that pops up a lot is when the land sells and um, and how do you apportion if the if the farmer's going to pay the rent late in the year, how do you apportion that rent? Um, like I said, I've put a, put together an, an article on this. It's 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 being reviewed. It's just a draft. Um, I always welcome comments on anything I write about whether I'm I'm crazy or or um, or uh, need to think about some different things. But in getting to agreements um, in wait, you know, again in in. Wake County, this is becoming I, over generations uh, less and less common, you know, to have um, that large going concern farm continue on still, you know, a number of them. But for that person on the land, even a person, a co-owner, um, I, I believe that the family should execute or the owner should execute a lease in favor of that person that's going to uh, be farming that land. I just think it very much clears up. Uh, what the expectations of all the parties are. Um, it protects the risk of the, um, certainly the farmer, the farmer sibling that's, that's farming that land. Um, I have, again, if you explore the farm law website, I've got you know, number, some, a lot of stuff that, tr- that deals with, with leases, some samples. There's some samples in that handbook. Um, I put watermarks because I don't want landowners using them, but I, I do come across um, a lot of situations where folks are looking uh, or working with a lawyer that doesn't quite have somebody like Jason's experience. Um, and so part of my job, I feel, is to try to help as best I can uh, pr- put some language out there for people to, for lawyers to look at. Um, but uh, uh, just know that if, if long-term use of the land is something that's critical to, uh, to one, of the, um, one of the co-owners, 
um, uh, that to protect that right, to protect that leasehold right, if it's going to be in excess of three years, um, that lease has to be recorded. Um, um, or no, I'm sorry, it has to be written. If you're going, if the lease, if, if the person leasing the land uh, is going, if the land's going to be sold, and that person uh, needs to have their leasehold protected, um, that lease is going to have to have been recorded prior to um, to sale uh, for that that leasehold to be protected. Um, uh, I, I know you had a presentation on present use valuation uh, earlier. I just bring this up uh, again, another article. Uh, but just be very careful when you're making um, uh, property dispositions, particularly in a county like Wake County. Um, I think Wake County is uh, is certainly probably been even moving even their you know their, their as, a, as values have gone way up. Um, use value as it's calculated. My understanding of it is is it's not connected to that highest and best use. Um, market value. And so it can still remain relatively low even over the course of time um, uh, because it's supposed to be generally tracking uh, um, rental values and, um, um, and timber values. Uh, but just be very careful not to disqualify property in a county like Wake uh, when you're distributing it, um, either dividing it up. Uh, you have to be mindful of the, of the, acreage, of the acreage required. Um, uh, but making decisions ahead of time when you're going to sell it um, about putting forward um, uh, how the how the land's going to be dealt with in terms of, um, of of a rollback. If you know it's going to be taken out of agricultural use, making sure that you as the seller are not going to be the one that's holding um, or have to you know pay for that at closing um, as best you can. Put that forward and, and have that as part of the um, uh part of what the, the buyers is going to be dealing with. So um, uh, this is a little off topic, but just a common, very common question I get um, about fence law in North Carolina, I dropped an L there, um, just to make sure that, uh, that you know, know that it's a, it is a misdemeanor to, um, to let your livestock loose. No one lets their livestock loose. That's property. We don't want to just throw it away. Um, but the, uh, um, that's our, that's the nature of our fence law is just make is a uh, requirement that livestock be fenced in. Um, but, uh, the, I get calls almost once a week, um, about livestock being loose and what the liabilities are out there if something happens. Um, and I'm always very interested in the topic because, you know, local sheriffs, uh, animal control offices, they deal with, you know, they have their own way of dealing with things, but there's, there are some, there's some state law on, you know what happens when livestock gets out, and um, uh, and and um, and something happens out there. Uh, Jason talked about the the estate planning side of it, and and, and mentioned estate taxes. Um, uh, when I talk about property disposition, I generally uh, look at it through that lens um, because, again, there's only three ways to dispose of property. You sell it, you give it away, or, or, um, or hold it till you die. And particularly, and again, as Jason pointed out, um, the primarily the capital gains tax issue that's embedded in sale and gifting decisions is one to be very, very cautious of. Um, uh, he also mentioned the estate tax. I would note that I don't know if he brought this up, but it's our current very, very high exemption that we have, um, which in Wake County may not seem as, as high, but in, in more rural uh, farming counties, that's going to um, uh, land is, is still sticking closer to farming values. Um, that this law is going to sunset in uh, four years, in 2026. And the exemption is going to go back down to $5 million. So um, three years ago, I wasn't saying as much about it, but that's not a very long time. And so it is it is critical, particularly if you have high value land, um, you know, to be doing that advanced planning with somebody like Jason, um, just knowing that right now, 12 million seems like a lot of money married, uh, that's doubled. Um, but it's going to it's going to go down, um, and uh, whether or not Congress is able to actually you know come to agreement on uh, passing further legislation, we just don't know what what that's going to look like in 2026. So just putting it out there as a as something to look at for the future. Um, 
when we talk about disposition of property of death and 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 creating co-tenancies, um, it again, I, I I believe that unless uh, the and I I encourage folks to be very careful in terms of of trying to avoid co-tenancy. Um, identifying if you have multiple parcels of land, identifying um, uh, those parcels to individual devisees so they're not sharing it. Um, uh, but but co-tenancy occurs uh, whether you die with a will um, or whether you die intestate without a will, it, partic particularly with intestate succession. Um, but uh, for folks that have wills that say, you know, I, I I bequeath my property, devise and bequeath my property to my spouse. If my spouse predeceases me, to my children, share and share alike, or for stirpes, um, or, or how, whatever language they use, um, it's still going to create you know raw co-tenancy interests and in, in property. Just a quick quick illustration. Um, I'm celebrating the 50th anniversary of uh, of um, of Godfather here, um, and so this is the family that I'm using to just illustrate it. These are the land holdings. I think I pulled this out of Halifax County. Um, uh, I have land here that's been inherited by uh, Vito Corleone. I have land that was purchased by Vito and Carmela Corleone um, during their marriage as, in his survivorship property. So um, let's just say that they have reciprocal wills um, and uh, Carmela survives Vito. Uh, we know that Sonny had a business dispute that he didn't survive um, in 19, I think it was I had 47, but I think it was 46. Um, and, uh, and this is the result. Um, Carmela is gonna, um, um, gonna end up owning all the property under that scenario she survives because she, um, uh, she owns the, ten, the joint property outright and then uh, the property is gonna go to her. But what about the scenario where um, where Carmel has predeceased uh, Vito. Um, and so uh, the result is going to be, again, if the right language is used in the will to make sure that Sonny's share of that property is preserved, um, then his children are going to get that. I, yep, for Godfather fans, I know I've left Tom Hagen out of this and I've left Vincent out of this. Um, but uh, but generally you see the 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 result and and it's gonna you're gonna end up with property that's um that's owned in fractions by um by a number of people that that may or may not be interested um in the in the management of it um so um let's uh so just a quick um demonstration of intestate share and this this goes to something that jason talked about um, and it, it is very, very important to uh, pay close attention to the surviving spousal rights. Um, uh, this is just an example that I did based on the Intestate Succession Act, but a lot of the calculations are for the what the spouse's elective share are going to be originate here. Um, there's that one third um, inheritance right that uh, um, that Jason mentioned. That's in the um, that, that's you know also a, a minimum feature of the. Um, of the the, um, of the elective share statute. So, um, but either way, you can see that, um, that how property interests get divided up very, very quickly. So I guess to the point of the presentation, how are we managing um, these particular interests? Again, uh, if land gets sold shortly after the death of the person, the, the, last, the, the last survivor in the, the, um, the ancestor generation, um, that's, uh, that's something it'll be dealt with. Um, but if you're in a situation where you're dealing with, um, you know, protecting a legacy or it just at least there's someone in the family that needs to, or really is able, you know, going to be able to do it. That's another issue is that none of this comes for free. People who want to hold on to property at some point are going to have to be able to pay for it. The, the point I'm making here with the slide is that, um, I've always been a fan, or at least was in practice, of creating what I call the internal marketplace for the property inside the family. And so there's a number of different ways you can do that. Um, I've never actually executed a tenancy in common agreement. I did draft some on behalf of clients who ended up going with the, um, an LLC option, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but it's something that's certainly possible. And certainly the fewer owners you have, um, probably the greater utility something like that is, is going to be. 
I think once you get beyond um, five, you know, owners outside of the same generation, um, it gets a lot uh, more difficult. And particularly if you have um, minors that are going to be um, uh, also co-owners. Um, but I also, and I put some of uh, materials on this in the handbook and they're going to be on the website soon, um, but also options to purchase. Um, uh, when I was drafting trusts and family land was a big issue, um, I was usually inserting with the client's permission um, some some little bit of a fail-safe device in there that if uh, another beneficiary of a trust wanted to sell their property at some point that another member of the family would have um, have a right of first offer or right of first refusal on that on that property, whatever the, the, uh, the client was preferring. Um, and that to me is, is something that, um, that could be useful uh, in the right situation, um, requiring that any property rights that are changing either by will or by trust um, be accompanied by that um, by that restriction. And again, it's something that does have to be well drafted and, and, and uh, certainly recorded to have any, any effect at all. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm running short on time. Uh, use of business entities. Um, the, always a big caution here is, uh, is this is another way to create an internal marketplace in your family for, um, you know, for again, preservation of a legacy and, and, um, and transferring this interest down through generations. But um, I think the time limit on, on these uh, just, it really depends on how active the family is and not just a few members of the family, but the whole family, anybody with an interest in the scenario, um, how active that family is in creating that, um, the, the legacy. Um, or creating the, the, the interest or the buy-in, at least among some family members that are going to be able to, at the right time, purchase these interests and eventually, you know, consult, what I, I look at is consolidate ownership. I, I had some situations where the, the family's goal was to try to, um, to make sure that every member shared in the wealth of the, um, of, or in the legacy, you know, had access, things like that. Um, and the LLC doesn't necessarily create that, that can be done by other agreements, but the, my view was always that your goal to keep land in the family, so to speak, over the long term, if that's a legacy that's, um, that's being protected, is to reduce the number of owners over time, try to consolidate as best as possible um, the land title into those that are going um, to hold on to it. So, um, but as a primer, another article there. Um, but I've, you know, I've done a number of LLC uh, in my time in practice, I did a number of LLCs for, for land, um, a lot of times with adult siblings um, that uh, want to go ahead and try to protect the, the, the farming value of it by keeping it all together. Um, if they weren't just going to you know, lease it out to where the farmer was and at the same time protecting a legacy, of course. Uh, but um, but it's something that can certainly be done. But I, in my experience, uh, and I, I, I know a lot of folks have probably had this experience, um, or uh, legal professionals, you might look at, at planning that has been done years and years ago um, for use of an LLC um, that just that didn't, it had an operating agreement um, that had some of these features, um, but at some point, and I guess my global point with all this, or these documents is if it isn't written, it, you don't have a foot in the door, um, but with a lot of written agreements, um, when there's a dispute, ultimately, um, the, the backdrop, of course, is, is the courtroom. And so it's going to be interpretation of the documents. It's going to be the thing that's key. And so my, my point is, and, and this was a, a mentor at Virginia Tech once said this to me, he's like, you can't paper over people. Um, but the paper, again, provides the foot in the door for somebody that's looking to hold on to those family interests um, against, uh, against it just simply being put out for partition. Um, operating agreement, just r r real quick, we've got, um, uh, I, put some, I put another article together just on some sample clauses, um, things to consider uh, that, that when folks are interested in pursuing this option. And again, it's not there to promote or suggest it. It's there to kind of give you a more, uh, a just uh, some time to, to digest it. Uh, uh, and again, they're just my thoughts on it. 
um, but, uh, um, but it's there for your consumption. I think that, Teresa, am I out of time? I had a few more slides, but they're, they're somewhat redundant. Um, Andrew, you got, you got time. So go ahead if you got a couple more things you want to talk about there since you got your final time. Um, okay, um, have any questions come in at all? Lauren, do you see any questions in the chat or in the comment box? I did have two comments I wanted to address, but they weren't necessarily specific to this. So, um, so, so why don't you go ahead and finish, Andrew, and then we can get to them. Okay. Uh, Righto. Okay. Um, so, uh, I'll yeah, I'll just finish out the LLC thing. And so, one of the primary you know uses for using a limited liability company um, to as you know as the form of agreement between co-tenants. Um, is to me the the um, the features that you find in there restricting ownership of the entity normally in a family land legacy situation that's going to be a restriction of actual ownership um, you know, ownership that that where you're participating in the in the company um, uh, um, decisions in some form or fashion um, uh, is going to be restricted to lineal descendants of a chosen you know uh, patriarch and matriarch. Um, and so what that does is it, again, creates a system of rights that are descending down from that, that starting point um, and deciding you know, whether someone does have the right to participate in buying out someone else's interests, whether someone has the right in approving certain large decisions, however, the, you know, again, however the management structure um, uh, is, is put together in the operating agreement. Um, but I, this, I have the slide up here, the buy-sell agreement. That's what I've always looked at as a nuclear core. Again, it's the internal marketplace. Um, does it always go smoothly? I would argue probably not. Um, but it, what it does do is it, it provides language that is a, it's, it's what governs the property interest, ultimately, that land in the LLC is a personal property interest, but that personal property interest comes with this constitution, so to speak. Um, and so it's something that can be enforced if it needs to, but it's to the best as possible, it breaks things down to objective measurement or at least requirements for seeking objective measurement, particularly of value. Um, and so um, in the operating agreement itself, when someone's gonna buy out another's interest, um, whether it's uh, a voluntary sale, whether it's um, something has happened uh, and that interest is in danger of, of becoming assigned to an ex-spouse or uh, uh, to a creditor, whatever the situation, um, you want to make sure that there's an objective way to appraise and resolve appraisal disputes. And then for closely held families, um, you know what the what the buyout or how the what the purchase how the purchase price is set and the payment terms, um, and you know it's again, it, your the goal is having the folks that are involved in this um, be able to voluntary or at least you know cooperate with it without um, without objection. Um, but that's that, that's not not something that's within your control is certainly the landowner that's planning or even the, um, you know, the, the siblings that co tenants that might might pursue this option. You certainly um, you're doing it because you're all looking at each other across the kitchen table and going, yep, we're going to do this. Are we good? Are we good? Um, but again, uh, there has to be some very active education on the part of the next generation uh, that's ultimately going to be having to navigate through. Um, this type of structure, um, whether they're interested in it or not. So, um, but uh, one of the, um, and what, I mean, always one of the utility, the uses of using LLCs as um, uh, family land planning devices. Um, uh, I, I see this is, this certainly applies when the, when the LLC owns land, but uh, a greater utility to me when the L, for your when you're operating uh, your farm LLC is just it it creates a convenient way to transfer interests um, outside of having to have those interests um, uh, um, uh, purchased and uh, can do so you know within the annual gift tax exclusion 
Um, just my, my preference is always to, even though LLC membership interests are just a percentage, they're not shares like a corporation, you can elect to do that. Um, you can just create um, an arbitrary number of units and say that this, the 100% the interest of this company is measured in 3,000 units. And then you can measure those, the value of each unit um, against a current um, uh, valuation of the property and know how much you're actually able to give um, or gift to the next generation. Now, of course, those gifts are going to be controlled by the operating agreement. Um, uh, depend, it can be they can be freely done or they can um, there could be um, uh, restrictions on those. Um, so I went back, I, I left out a couple of, of slides that I'd done in another presentation, but um, just the, it, it, at the end of the day here, let's say that the Corleone family, um, the siblings, um, the surviving uh, siblings in the next generation after Vito and Carmela decided to deed their land to a um, LLC. Um, and uh, they might've um, designated Michael as what we call the manager of it. And, and Michael is gonna be making the day-to-day -day, um, decisions um, probably up to a point, um, at some point, uh, you want, and use doing this, you want to limit uh, the, the manager's ability to do things like use the land as collateral. Um, you may not want to inhibit timber sales or leasing decisions or anything like that, but if it's something that's going to have a major financial impact, you can identify that in the operating agreement and limit the, um, the, um, uh, the manager's um, uh, uh, um, uh, powers. Um, and, you know, does this work in a, a lot of different types of situations? You know, we talk about land and income, open farmland, as you know, rents are not, um, farmland rent is, is something that's a, a bit more variable and not as lucrative as owning um, larger timber interests, which, where you can do regular cuts and, it, and there's regular distributions of income. So, again, I'm just putting these out there as, as, um, as tools that are available in the uh, Use the word toolbox, so to speak, um, but uh, you know you, you really need to rely on your professional advisor to listen to what it is you want um, to happen, be able to assess the situation around you in terms of your family, and and you know as Jason mentioned, caution you on you know what the ultimate outcome might be. Um, that that certainly it, you know it could work out this way, but other but there's other scenarios that it might might play out that might provide difficulty down the road. Um, and that's all I have. Uh, like I said, I just really wanted to, my purpose here was I wanted to make y'all aware of the, of the extension resource that I'm, I'm managing and trying, you know, in my role now as an educator, uh, trying to distill these, uh, a lot of these topics into, um, into various media for, uh, um, for self-education. Thank you, Andrew. That, that is a lot of great information, and I've actually um, utilized that resource on your website quite a bit. So he has a lot of great uh, articles, a lot of great information um, when it comes to all different top topics as far as farmland protection. And, and just like he's sharing with you today um, with information as far as agreements and things uh, as well. Um, one of the things you brought up, Andrew, I thought was very important um, that we deal with a lot in Wake County is the uh, verbal farm tendencies. Um, I would imagine uh, I've been working in, in Wake County for 15 years now um, with, with farmers and, and farm landowners, and the majority of the, um, the rental of ag land for farm production is by verbal. And so that's a lot of good points there to make. Um, we always get asked some of those questions um, when dealing with that from year to year, not knowing uh, as far as um, land use, um, you know, with changes within the, the ownership of the land. Um, when that happened. So um, I think I think that was really good information that that, that, I, that actually I learned a lot um, from that as well. Um, I think we did have some questions, um, Lauren, that you wanted to, to bring up. Yes, yeah. First, a comment from Brian Mims uh, asking about farmers who might want to do the workshop or have an interview. Uh, and I just wanted to share, if you're still listening, Brian, that our communications team said they'd be happy to coordinate any kind of interview. So and two of them are on this uh, meeting as well. So we'd love to coordinate with that with you. Um, and then second uh, question here from Bill Thornton, uh, saying my wife and I live on a working cattle farm in Northeast Wake and enjoy the present use tax rate for our 67 acres 
Uh, the problem is we are aging out of being able to work cattle. Is there a way to keep the lower tax rate if we sell our herd? Uh, the farm is not suited to row crops and we are too old to start a venue and I don't want to plant trees in my pasture. So I'm not sure they're the best person for that one. Uh, it might be more of a custom case, but uh, I'm just putting that one out there. Um, am I still on? Uh, yeah, my, th I mean, my thought on that scenario, again, at the end of the day, the requirement's going to be that $1,000 gross of uh, gross in income. And um, before you said, don't, I don't want to plant, don't want to plant trees in the pasture. I was like, okay, well, that's off the table. Um, that's, of course, the, I, my, in my opinion, the easiest way to stay in the program, just get the forestry plan and go ahead and plant, um, assuming you have the, the requisite minimum of 20 acres. But I would say that what, what, you're looking at now is recruiting, um, uh, recruiting an, uh, someone else to either put put cattle on the land or hay it. Um, you know, talk to somebody about getting, making sure you have a good grass variety that's going to produce a good hay product, um, and then uh, um, do that. And then you can use the you can use the tenants' records as your your as if you were producing the income. So that's, I, that was probably brought up earlier, I'm sure in the present use value presentation, but um, the thousand dollars gross requirement for open farmland is either income that you produce yourself or that you show that your tenant is producing. And so um, that uh, that's to me is an option there. And I'm forgetting off the top of my head whether CRP payments count towards that $1,000 gross, but I, I can't remember. <laughs> It does, Andrew. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Okay, so that 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 would be another option to re, you know retire that land. But I think from a if I was from a putting my local foods hat on and and farm opportunities hat on, um, I would say you know please do consider um, if a, if there's sufficient access to where it isn't bothering you all too much, you know making that land available to someone else to farm. Um, but I, I applaud you keeping it open because that's 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 how we lose a lot of farmland is just growing it up in trees. Exactly. exactly. And I, I'll follow up with Andrew had some great points and, and, and that would be our recommendation. And, and Mr. Thornton, um, if you can if you can hear us and um, we're going to be providing a slide at, at the end of our, our workshop today uh, with our contact information. And um, I would encourage you to reach out to our office, the Wake County Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, these are the type of questions that we get asked um, pretty much daily, uh, weekly, um, farm and forest landers like yourself. And um, what we do, we have conservationists in our office that do conservation planning. And so that we would like to do a site visit evaluation on your farm and to work with you to see, you know, what, 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 what can work um, and still maintain that, that present use value. And we can work with you on different, different options and things that we can, we can help you with and, and guide you in the right direction to make sure that you don't use, don't lose, I'm sorry, your present use value, but also we work with you um, based on what you want to do with your land to make your, make sure you're successful, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, down the road for whatever ventures you would like to go to next or for the future generations as well. So um, we would be happy to work with you. That's what we do. We love doing that. And so we'll have a slide um, at the end with our contact information, uh, but you can also go to wakegov.com and, and our, our soil and water uh, website as well and get our, our contact information. So, but that's a great question. It's something we deal with uh, all the time here in our office. Do you see any more, Lauren? No, that's all I've got for now. Thank you. Next up, um, very excited to, to welcome a newcomer as well, I believe. Um, it, this is his first time, uh, especially in his new role. Uh, we have Evan Davis, uh, the Farmland Preservation Division Director in the North Carolina Department of Agriculture. Uh, he took leadership of the Farmland Preservation Division in the very beginning of 2022. Uh, he previously served as Assistant Director since 2018. I think he's from Davis, Davison County, grew up near High Point, uh, working in uh, Future Farmers of America and uh, different ag programs. And he, I think he joined the North Carolina Department of Agriculture back in 2012. So um, he's going to talk about farmland preservation. Um, I, I have worked with uh, Evan for a lot uh, over the last few months, seen a lot of his presentations. And I think a lot of the facts and figures that, that he's going to share um, with our farm and forest land owners today, um, it will be kind of eye-opening to see where we're at in uh, Wake County and where we're at in North Carolina as far as the, the loss 
of farmland and, and what it means to us as residents of the state in, in this county. So uh, with that, um, Evan, I'll take, uh, I'll let you uh, take it away there. Thank you, Teresa. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you fine. All right, great. I'm going to share my screen. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, I can see it. Looks All good, right, sir. great. Well, thanks so much for having me today. Um, like Teresa teed it up there, we're going to talk about why these farmland preservation efforts are so important. Uh, today I'll be speaking about the Agricultural Development and Farmland Preservation Trust Fund. It is the primary program of the North Carolina Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services Farmland Preservation Division. And so I'll speak about all the different funding opportunities from the trust fund. Uh, we see these as playing a critical part in keeping the farm. And near the end of the presentation, I'll be speaking about a grant option specifically for landowners. So if we set the scene here, in June of 2020, the American Farmland Trust, uh, that's a national uh, nonprofit advocating for the preservation of farmland across the United States. They released the most comprehensive study on farmland loss in the United States to date. And their study found that North Carolina was the second most threatened state for farmland loss in the whole country. And based on their analysis, between 2001 in 2016, North Carolina had 732,000 acres of ag land converted from those uses to non-ag uses. And to kind of give you an idea of the scope of that, uh, the entire state of Rhode Island is just over 900,000 acres in size. So uh, that kind of gives you an idea of how much land we're speaking about. Um, so again, second most out of all the states during that time period. And their study looked at two uses after it was converted. One is urban and highly developed land use. And so in their study, that's an acronym UHD. And the other is low density residential LDR. And so if we think about what low density residential is, those are subdivisions. And so in North Carolina, out of the total land loss that we see there, 732,000, 78% of that was converted to LDR, low density residential. That's 571,000 acres. And that was the highest conversion rate in all of the United States. All right, so let's take a look at some more findings that they had. Out of that 732,000 acres lost, 59% of it was categorized as nationally significant land. Now, this is a, an attribute that the American Farmland Trust created, uh, and it's looking at the most productive soil. So here's their definition. Nationally significant land is the best land for the long-term production of food and fiber. It takes two to three times the amount of marginal ag land to make up for the productivity of nationally significant land. So not only is farmland being converted, nearly 60% of that in North Carolina was our most productive and best land. And so if you look at that breakdown again, you can see the raw figure there on the conversion of that nationally significant land in North Carolina. North Carolina is among the top states for the conversion of ag land to these other uses. They looked at policy response rate in the state. They graded us as a medium. They had low, medium, and high, so we were right in the middle there. Uh, but Overall, the ag conversion threat is higher than our policy response. So that means we still have work to do. So they have a great tool on their website. And this is really where this is so comprehensive. This is a spatial analysis and this is a static photo. But if you look here, you can see in red, those are the areas that were converted from ag land to the urban highly developed or the low density residential. 
Kind of makes sense, right? You can see where those are concentrated. The dark green, those are the nationally significant farmland that's still uh, active. The lighter green are below that, but they're still ag lands. So if we zoom in here on Wake County, you can see the red. And I'm sure folks can find their communities and they can probably tell you uh, the history there of what has happened in those red areas. But I wanna look at those green patches. You can see some great areas in the northeastern part of the county, down in the southeastern as well. So the point is there's still opportunities here in Wake County and we need to take advantage of that. So when we talk to our broader audiences, we want to explain why it's so important to preserve farms and forests in North Carolina. Well, year over year, we find that agriculture and agribusiness is the top industry in North Carolina. One sixth of the state income employees are in the ag and agribusiness industry. And so to put a number on that, economic impact of 95.9 billion, and that's 16% of the gross state product. Of course, working lands provide fresh local foods to North Carolina residents, and then we're able to export those products across state lines and internationally as well. The second biggest sector for economic impact is the military in North Carolina. And we've had extensive work and great partnerships with the armed services to preserve lands that have compatible land uses between the two. So we're proud of those partnerships, especially down east. Tourism is the third biggest economic sector. And we think rural landscapes play a big part into the tourism industry. When you look at environmental benefits, well-managed farms are great for the environment. And so there's lots of benefits there and we're really emphasizing that in the division uh, with uh, the larger focus on climate resilience. We think that farmers in ag lands and forest lands play a key part in that effort. And then we're gonna look at cost of community services studies here in a little bit, but in every single study that's been conducted in North Carolina, for every county that's had one done, working lands are a net provider of local tax dollars rather than a net user. And we'll talk about that a little more in detail shortly. So this pyramid here is the hierarchy of farmland preservation. And so if you start at the bottom, those are kind of the first steps into uh, getting involved with farmland preservation on your land. And we'll talk about VAD, voluntary ag districts here in a little bit, but that's kind of the first step. And then with the enhanced VAD, there's a little bit more commitment there. That's the next step up funded conservation agreements. We haven't had that occur in the state yet, but it's still an option. This would be something where landowners are incentivized with an agreement similar to an enhanced VAD. And then we're gonna get into term and perpetual conservation easements. And we're gonna talk about this in detail here in a little bit. But when we look at the trust fund and what we do, this uh, trust fund was established uh, in the 2005 legislative session and farmland preservation remains one of Commissioner Steve Troxler's top priorities. And so what we do with the trust fund, we provide grants to county governments and nonprofit organizations for easements, agricultural agreements and programs. And we'll talk about those different funding opportunities in just a moment. Our mission, is to encourage the preservation of qualifying ag, horticultural, and forest lands to foster the growth, development, and sustainability of family farms. Any grants we provide must fit under this mission statement. And what we're gonna do, we're gonna try our best to leverage as much resource funding as we can. So when we look at our funding, most of it comes from North Carolina general appropriations. When we provide grants, most of the time, that's where the funding comes from. Now, what we also do is we look for other resources. We try to look at other grant opportunities throughout the state to see if we can extend our funds even further. 
We do the same thing with federal programs that are available. I mentioned our partnerships with the military. We do have cooperative agreements with two military services, and we have other ones that are in progress. Uh, but those allow us to leverage more funding for those specific types of projects. And we're always on the lookout for anything else that can help us preserve more farmland. So who may apply for trust fund grants? I just mentioned this just a moment ago, county governments and private nonprofit conservation organizations. When speaking with landowners, it's important for them to team up with one of these two. So we do have Wake Soil and Water on the board. They would be an eligible entity. Triangle Land Conservancy will be uh, having a presentation right after me. They're an eligible entity. So any landowner that's interested in a conservation easement through the trust fund, they need to work with one of these two organizations. We do have an open grant cycle each year. This is for our competitive statewide grants. These are held between mid-October and mid-December each year. We do provide application materials a month ahead of time. Um, so if you're interested, you can take a look at our website, ncadfp.org. You can see the application materials from this past grant cycle. We don't suspect a lot of changes for the one this fall, so you can kind of get an idea of what's going on. Um, but those materials for the new grant cycles are put out on our website one month ahead of time. So mid-September, we'll have those new materials out. So grant categories. Um, agricultural development projects. I'll give some good examples of these in uh, the next slide. Uh, but these are public-private enterprise programs for uh, the enhancement of ag, family farms, agribusiness. Agricultural plans, we have three categories for these, voluntary ag districts, farmland protection plans, and cost of community services studies. So I'll talk about those in detail in just a few moments. So here are our categories, our general categories for agricultural development projects. And the reason I bring these up is because, you know, these are important tools to enhancing agriculture in counties. And so you can see the different categories there. The easiest ones uh, that we can think of are farmer's market or livestock facilities. Um, but as long as an idea fits into one of these categories, we'll take a look at it and see uh, if it can meet our statutory and administrative rule uh, obligations. But just to give you an idea of all the different things that uh, we could potentially fund through grant projects. Voluntary Ag Districts. Wake County has a Voluntary Ag District program. The overarching mission of the VAD program is to encourage the voluntary protection of farmlands and to let landowners publicly recognize their farms. Uh, these are county level ordinances and there's quite a few benefits. One is going to be the Agricultural Advisory Board. There's several different functions of the Ag Advisory Boards in the counties, but probably the most important is they provide a voice for agriculture to county leadership. Half mile record notice, proximity of farmlands. If you're enrolled in the VAD program, the counties have to provide some type of half mile record notice from your farm. The most common methods are through GIS systems or deed notation, uh, but this allows folks who are researching uh, deeds or land records or checking out the maps on the GIS websites. If you're enrolled in the VAD, you'll be able to see that any parcels within a half mile buffer, buffer will be uh, noted on these types of maps. Uh, managed in accordance with NRCS practices for highly erodible land. Um, so again, going back to well-managed farms, if the land is identified as HEL, uh, then they are required to have those types of conservation practices on the ground. The 10-year conservation agreement, again, this is a commitment by the landowner to keep it as a farm or a forest for that time period. Again, VAD, voluntary, it is a voluntary program, so you can withdraw with no penalty. Um, kind of going back to why we said that's the first step in farmland preservation. Now, there are some parts of the statute that are uh, optional, so to speak. Counties can choose to include these. So 
one of the most uh, tangible benefits of the VAD program, public hearings on condemnation. So if there's a public action by a government entity, most commonly in these scenarios, we're talking about a DOT action. If it affects a VAD and the county ordinance has this in their uh, ordinance, then a public hearing can be called. Another one is going to be the waiver of water and sewer assessments, again, uh, providing that type of benefit directly to the landowner. We spoke about enhanced VAD as the next step in the hierarchy of farmland preservation. There's a few more benefits here, especially with gross sales of non-farm products, keeping the bona fide farm status. But the main thing about the enhanced program is that the 10-year conservation agreement is irrevocable. So you're, so you're making that commitment for 10 years to keep it as a farm or a forest. So if we, if we look statewide, 91 counties have the program. The ones in dark green have the enhanced VAD option as part of their county program. So a few more left to try to get on board here. I mentioned farmland protection plans just a moment ago. These are strategic plans for counties to have, and, and what it's based on are a few different things. There, there are five requirements in the farmland protection plan statute. And these are the minimum things that the farmland protection plans have to include. Uh, but if you look here, we're looking at existing ag activity, the challenges to continued family farming, what are the opportunities for enhancing the local ag economies, and then putting it into effect, what's the schedule for doing so, and then how can we support this plan? Um, so these are across the state, 64 counties have these. Wake County does have a farmland protection plan. Uh, off the top of my head, I think it was 2016 when that was passed. Um, so we do encourage counties to look at these at least annually to make sure that the schedule is being followed. And then if any updates are needed, uh, they can make those adjustments. The last one, cost of community services studies. So this is an analysis of the fiscal contribution of existing land uses in the county. And so these plans look at three land uses generally. They look at residential, commercial, and ag lands. And so what they're gonna look at is um, where are the contributions coming from and where are the services going? And so there's 20 counties throughout the state that have done these plans. And as I mentioned before, every single one has found that ag lands are net providers of local tax dollars. And so here are the overall stats for the different plans or studies that were conducted. Uh, for every dollar of revenue generated by ag lands, the cost of community services provided is 53 cents. If you flip it the other way, for every dollar of community services provided, the revenue generated by ag lands is $1.90. Wake County had a plan in 2001. The Solon Water District was awarded a grant through the trust fund in our last grant cycle to update that plan. Um, so we were happy to do so and we're looking forward to seeing how things have changed in the county. If you take a look here, the ones in red were conducted by NC State University and the ones in green conducted by the University of Mount Olive. All right, so now let's get into the specific program for landowners. Conservation easements. This is the uh, largest amount of grant funds that are provided by the trust fund. Here's the official definition there. It is a legal tool that restricts residential, commercial, and industrial development of land to maintain its agricultural production capability. And so the overall purpose, we wanna make sure that lands remain in ag, horticulture, or forestry uses. So what we're going to do as a trust fund, we're going to provide grants to remove the development rights off the property and almost all of the other associated costs to get to that point. So this means that the grants can provide compensation to landowners for the purchase of the development rights. 
one important thing we want to emphasize is that these properties that are subject to these conservation easements, they remain in private ownership. We are not in the business of fee simple. This is not the state uh, converting that land. We're not buying any, we're not buying that fee simple interest. We want to keep farmers on the land and maintain their livelihoods. And, you know, we think that keeping the farm preserved in private ownership has benefits that go well beyond just the benefit to those landowners. It's keeping the land on the county, the county tax rolls. It's keeping uh, a business afloat, which means other employees going beyond the landowners. Um, and so, again, we're thinking that this goes much more beyond just that immediate benefit to the landowners with the purchase of those development rights. As I mentioned before, county governments and conservation nonprofits are the ones that apply on behalf of landowners that are interested in conservation easements. They are the ones that will be the easement holders. And so the easement holders are the ones that are enforcing the terms and conditions of these conservation easements. And we'll talk about some of those restrictions here in just a moment. We got to make sure that these are these properties are abiding by those terms and conditions, and so monitoring of the conservation easement uh, will be conducted primarily by the easement holders. Anyone that has uh, any type of funding investment in these, so the state or if the federal partners are involved, they're going to have uh, enforcement rights as well. Um, but these are done for the term of the conservation easement. 93% of our conservation easements that are funded are perpetual. So I guess in simple terms, that means as long as there's a state in North Carolina, those are going to be in effect. So it is quite uh, an investment by those uh, conservation easement, uh, easement holders. But uh, again, going back to all the other costs that we do provide grants for, stewardship endowment costs are also available to help alleviate some of those long-term costs. So here's some more details about uh, the conservation easements. Like we saw on the pyramid there, term easements and perpetual easements are available through the trust fund. Term just means that after a set number of years, the easement will expire. There is a difference in the funding level based on the number of years, uh, but that is something to consider as a private landowner. Uh, this is a real estate process. It's going to be recorded on the land deed. An important thing to note is that these easements are trans they transfer with the land. So whether that's through a land sale or inheritance or some other type of transfer, the easement goes with the land. So that's a very important consideration when planning out uh, the, 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 any potential easement that a landowner is interested in. Because the state has an interest in the property, we're filing that with the state property office. This helps us again with long-term management of the property. There's going to be things that uh, the landowner or they're still going to be responsible for in, in paying those taxes, land management. Those are things that are ongoing for the landowner. I mentioned about paying for some of those costs involved and here's a few of those inputs that we have to have to get to the finish line to record a conservation easement. So we're looking at the easement language itself, an appraisal of the land, survey, where that's a reliable meets and bounds for the easement, baseline documentation report, that is essentially a snapshot in time providing a baseline, that's where the name comes from, it provides the, uh, the starting point for the easement, environmental audit, making sure there's no uh, negative em environmental impacts on the property, and then, of course, making sure we have clear title. Uh, there's a great FAQ that we developed for landowners, and if you go to our website here, ncadfp.org backslash landowner FAQ.ht. M, you can take a look at a very extensive uh, FAQ page, and uh, it's a great resource for landowners and entities alike. So here's a big question that always comes up. What property rights are re 
obtained and what are removed by this easement. Um, so again, we're focusing on the development rights of the parcel, limiting non-ag uses. So here are going to be some of the pro prohibited activities. Subdivision of the property. Once the easement is recorded, it cannot be cut up and divided. So again, going back to that uh, process of planning things out, what's going to be the best way to uh, manage this property in the future? What's the best way to uh, transfer this? What's the best way for folks to inherit the property? Uh, we've heard a lot about that in um, you know, the Godfather example. Uh, how are we going to slice up uh, this piece of property with an easement on it? You got to do that ahead of time. So it takes a little bit of forethought there. Uh, again, going back to re uh, restricting the non-ag uses of the property. Um, so those types of things are going to be limited. Mining is going to be restricted. We want to preserve the topsoil for the production of food and fiber. Dumping and trash, again, those negative environmental impacts we want to limit. And commercial signage is also a restriction. Uh, I mentioned our partnerships with the military. They have their own restrictions as well. And so here are just a few of those examples. Large towers, upward facing lights. They don't want to do anything that restricts uh, their military training capabilities. Emphasizing this point again, the conservation easements through our program do not grant public access. As I mentioned, there are monitoring requirements to ensure the land is still in compliance with the terms and conditions of the easement, but these annual monitoring checks are scheduled with the landowner in advance. So um, no surprise visits or anything like that. The other rights on the property, the water rights, hunting rights, obviously the farming rights, mineral rights, timber rights, those all remain on the property. In our view, and, and this is proven with the nearly 30,000 acres under conservation easement across the state that were funded through the program, the landowners are able to continue to do what they've always done with their farming and timber practices. Um, so again, if there are more questions about um, the restrictions or what are the ongoing uh, responsibilities of landowners for these easements, we post the exact easement language out on our website. We have several different templates and those are based on uh, generally the funding sources involved with these projects. But you can take a look exactly at the easement language itself and see exactly what those types of restrictions are. We do want to let folks know that this is not an overnight process. Uh, and really this is a multi-year process from these initial conversations that landowners will have with co-owners or family members. Um, the application process, again, to give you just a brief timeline on that, I mentioned that the yearly deadline is in mid-December right now here in March, we're conducting our application evaluations. And if everything works out with the state budget, we like to have those grant contracts out in October. So really from application to a potential contract is already going to be a year. Uh, the process is involved to get the recorded easement done. We'd like to have those within a year from the contract date, but sometimes there are circumstances that can delay that process. We do offer our grant contracts on a two-year basis. Uh, so one year to get it done and one year for any types of hiccups that may come along with that process. But again, uh, we want to emphasize that this is a multi-year process if you're interested in conservation easements. If you are interested in it, talk to one of those eligible entities now and go ahead and start that process. It makes things a lot easier uh, the more uh, leeway that they have ahead of the application process. So again, what can you do to preserve your family farm? Enroll in VAD. Wake County, uh, along with almost all the other counties in the state, have to make some adjustments to their VAD ordinances. There were some uh, changes to the statute last summer. Uh, so Wake County is doing a great job uh, updating their ordinance. Um, but again, 
That's an option, first step in the hierarchy of farmland preservation. Talk with your family. I mean, again, this is a decision that can have implications for, if it's a perpetual conservation easement, forever. So this is uh, certainly something that uh, you do not want to take lightly. Have those important conversations with your families, potential heirs, business partners. However, uh, your land is made up, have those conversations. So again, like I just mentioned, talk with those eligible entities, have those conversations now and see if uh, they are a good fit for you and your land. The big caveat we'll always give, we're not given tax advice, we're not given legal advice. Uh, we can provide all the information required for the conservation easement to you, but you really need to speak with your own legal counsel and tax advisors on uh, the legal and financial implications of a conservation easement. Like I just mentioned, read the materials. Everything uh, is out there for folks to digest on our website. Um, so if you have specific questions about some of those documents, just let us know when you point in the right direction. Um, and then of course, find out what your interest level is going to be after digesting all that information. And then you can see what programs are available for your land. And then uh, once you have made your match with a county government or a land trust or a conservation nonprofit organization, uh, you can start working on that process. Um, so here's a listing of our staff. Uh, the ones at the top are uh, our central staff in office. The ones below are our regional field staffers. Uh, so for Wake County, Scott Scholars is uh, your field staffer. And so uh, if you have uh, some more questions, especially if you want to have that type of preliminary site visit on your farm to get uh, a better idea of how to lay things out or any other specific questions, uh, Scott can be your uh, first contact there in that process. And so with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you, Evan. I'll uh, give it just a few minutes. Um, <clears throat> Lauren can uh, let me know if he sees anything come through on the two streaming platforms that we're using. Um, it was a great presentation, Evan. You're right. You're, we're, we're working through our, our um, local voluntary ag district ordinance for Wake County um, um, with several other Wake County departments. So we hope to have some changes made to our ordinance uh, coming this summer as well. And hopefully, uh, fingers crossed, that we will also have that enhanced voluntary ag district opportunity uh, for our former forest land owners in Wake County. I did receive a call this week um, and spoke with a, a gentleman uh, landowner um, that um, because of certain um, benefits of that enhanced voluntary ag district, um, they're very interested. So uh, I think we have a lot of interest in the county uh, for doing that and that hierarchy that you gave um, from, from one step to the next. So. Um, we appreciate that information and we appreciate your guidance and, and everything that you do to help with farmland preservation um, across the state and, and here in Wake County um, as a resource professional for us. So uh, Lauren, do you uh, see any um, questions or anything in, in any of the uh, platforms? I did have one follow-up from Mr. Thornton uh, previously from the question he asked uh, about his, his farm. Um, <clears throat> no new ones, but his, his follow-up question was asking if it was only a thousand dollars in income for the entire farm, I think, which I think was, uh, in reference to what Andrew mentioned about the, um, the BUV guidance for that. Okay. Andrew or Chuck, um, I know Chuck and Braxton may be still on too. If they want to provide feedback, I'll, I'll let which, whichever one wants to, wants to answer. Sure. Can y'all hear me? Uh, you're very, uh, look, ve um, I can hear you just a little, but it's kind of faint. Let me see if I can turn my volume up. Hey, Teresa, it's, it's Braxton. I can uh, okay. jump in here. Yeah, it's an average of a thousand over uh, three years. Right. I, I thought that was it, but I definitely wanted the experts to to uh, rain on in that. So that is an average of a thousand dollars over that three year period. That's correct. So hopefully we've answered that question for Mr. Thornton, and again, he can. He can follow up for us if he has any additional questions.
anymore, Lauren? None at the moment. Just refreshing here to make sure. Yeah, no. Okay, great. Thank you, Evan. And we're we're on to our, our last presenter um, today, and and she's definitely no stranger to uh, to our keeping the farm workshop here in Wake County. Um, she can probably tell us how many years, but as, as long as I've been here, uh, Leanne Hammerbarker with uh, Triangle Land Conservancy has, has been here. Uh, Leanne served as as the director of Land Protection and Stewardship East. Uh, primary focus work on land protection and conservation uh, management planning in Wake and Johnston counties, but she also supports other projects throughout the triangle as well. Um, and as you heard our, our commissioner, uh, Chairman uh, Sig Hudgeson mentioned, I think in his welcome remarks, um, that Wake County has worked a lot um, and Triangle Land Conservancy has been our go-to partner uh, with farmland protection and, and conservation easements in Wake County. They, they really do the work, the legwork and stuff um, to make farmland protection possible in Wake and, and, and getting those grants that, that Evan talked about earlier. And um, I, I guess I uh, had some good news, Leanne, for Monday from the Wake County Commissioners. Um, we, we did get approval from them to uh, some use of those um, bond money um, for preservation of a, a active working uh, sheep farm in Zebulon. So that was great news to hear. I think it went out on media as well. So um, great job, Leanne, and, and Triangle Lake Conservancy, um, all those efforts. And I know it's a lot of years and a lot of hard work went into making that possible. So we appreciate you and I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Leanne, to, to start your presentation. Okay, great. Um, thanks for having me today. I have to admit I'm missing our forks meal. So I'm looking forward uh, that in the future we can hopefully be in person next year. Oops, sorry, that is the wrong one. Let me get my presentation pulled up here. And hopefully everyone can see that all right. So as Teresa said, I'm Leanne Hammerbacher. I'm with the Triangle Land Conservancy. And we're gonna touch on um, some of the work Evan spoke about with conservation easements, but also talk about um, a variety of options that TLC could potentially help you with to conserve your farm for the next generation of farmers. All of the pictures I have in my presentation are on properties that TLC has helped conserve, and most of them are from Wake County. Uh, so if you're not familiar with Triangle Land Conservancy, our mission really is to protect open space for four key public benefits, including natural habitats, supporting local food and farms, and connecting people with nature as well as water quality. We cover the six county triangle region. Since 1983, we've helped protect over 22,000 acres of land. Um, this is done through a variety of mechanisms, including conservation easements, but we also um, own land ourselves and farm land ourselves, as well as run a system of eight nature preserves that are shown here in these um, orange um, dots. In addition to that, we do cover the six counties I mentioned. We also have several priority areas across Wake County. Um, our priority areas are places that we have funding secured or established conservation plans to create landscape level conservation efforts. You'll notice the Upper News as well as the Cape Fear, Swift Creek, in the Marks Creek area. Uh, we work on projects outside of these areas. These are just places where we have um, ready resources uh, to help with land protection. I won't dive too much into this. Evan already qualified, um, uh, talked about many of these points and summarized a lot of the great work by the American Farmland Trust, but it's pretty remarkable that North Carolina is the second most threatened state in the nation for farmland loss. And um, try not to steal everyone's slides, but I definitely think uh, this slide this morning, uh, that 19% loss of farmland, you know, we're looking at over 20,000 acres since 2013 is really outstanding. I tried to do a quick back of the envelope calculation. Um, and I think on the flip side of this, still about 18% of the county is in farms. 
Uh, so it's not too late. And I just want to give a big thank you to all the landowners who are out there because this 18% is pretty remarkable for how urban of a county we are. And we know you face a lot of issues that a lot of rural farmers um, aren't facing yet and just appreciate all of your efforts um, to continue to farm in the rapidly growing county. Uh, TLC, one of our key benefits, as I mentioned, is to support local farms and food. Uh, we've protected almost 7,000 acres of farmland in our 39 years. Uh, we also have several um, properties we own where we partner with other organizations, including Transplantations, UCAN, CEFs, um, many partners at our Williamson farm where we make uh, farmland available um, to farmers. Uh, to provide a next step or a stepping stone um, to the next generation of farmers. In addition, we've helped support farmland plans. Um, we run two farm preserves. And of course, we also hold many working land seasons. So what can you do to protect your land? Um, I think uh, tending today is great. Everyone has touched on really important topics that you need to um, consider. Uh, there's a lot of steps that go into protecting your land and developing conservation plans, forest plans, forest stewardship plans are really some of the initial critical first steps to make sure you have something in place that can not only help with some of the tax issues, easements, other things um, that and challenges you're facing, but also really help you um, come up with a sound management plan um, for your farm. In addition, really, you know, working with folks like Jason and Andrew and other partners, coming up with a farm transition plan is key. Um, all of these things can really help with some of the cost share opportunities and planning resources that are out there. Uh, enrolling in the VAD, and hopefully we get an VAD in Wake County this year, can also really be critical to um, working um, you know, towards these longer term steps. In addition, I, I think um, Mr. Thornton had asked about you know, um, this valuation and having someone um, potentially farm your property can be a good way to continue to meet that present use. Um, through the extension office, uh, there is a farm link website and this is a great place and I'll follow up with the actual web link for this. But to find farmers, if you're aging out of farming and you don't have immediate heirs or someone else who is farming your property, you can best post a farm to this website as well as um, land seekers go to this website to help find um, farms and land that they might be able to um, help cultivate. Some more longer term options, again, can be conservation easements, um, possible conservation sale or donations of lands. Um, TLC can also help you with an assist or transfer of land to another entity. Uh, I put a link up here. Again, that long-term planning is really critical. Uh, TLC has been incredibly um, thankful that we have received multiple bequests of land, um, but really laying out your long-term uh, game plan and really where you would like to see your land in the future is so critical. Obviously working with an attorney, a state attorney professional is um, best. I just wanna put this out there. We do have a free service on our website. Um, if you don't have a will, it can really complicate things. Um, this is a free service that can help you draft up a, a quick will if needed. Um, so that link is on this website as well. Uh, we also have a good ground initiative I'm gonna talk about a little bit later that we are kicking off this year. So again, um, the main way TLC helps protect farmland is um, by Fee simple, what we call fee simple acquisition, where someone either donates land or TLC purchases land and continues to keep it um, as a farm. In addition, we also work on conservation easements and again, helping other entities um, work on both of these protection methods as well. So what is a conservation easement? I think um, Evan covered this in great detail, but um, it is a voluntary 
legal agreement that is binding and it's between a landowner and a qualified conservation organization that permanently limits certain uses of the land. Um, the ADFP program has a has template easements. Uh, TLC also has template easements. We're happy to share with people. Um, there are many different forms of easements that can protect different interests for the landowner, but the main thing in common that all these easements have is they typically limit future subdivision of the properties. Um, these are just some pictures of some land that is under working lands easement in Wake County that TLC owns. Why would anyone do this? Um, well, this quote, I think, um, uh, was great from a farmer we worked with. And he said, sometimes being good stewards of the land means going beyond the daily blood, sweat, and tears of working the farm. It means taking a stand for what you believe in. Another landowner said, after all these years of putting all this work into my farm, I didn't want a development to go up on my land as soon as I was six feet underground. I wanted to keep this beautiful place like it is. Other landowners, we wanted to protect our land so that people sitting here 50 or 100 years from now could see exactly what we are seeing today. Some other reasons you might protect your land. Um, again, all the work, energy, effort you've put into your farm. This is an example farm actually adjacent to our Williamson Preserve that we were able to work with the landowners on. Um, unfortunately, these landowners faced one of the issues uh, Jason brought up early on, long-term care. Um, they have lived and worked on this farm for over 30 years. Uh, we're moving into a care facility and really wanted to know that all their energy and effort was not for naught. And so they actually worked with TLC to place a conservation easement on the farm and then um, sold the farm. And I'm happy to convey that it continues to be farmed um, and stay in active production. Another example, we worked with a collective of um, group in Durham County known as the Earthsea Collective. They owned 11 acres and uh, adjacent farm of about 40 acres came up for sale. We were able to work with them through our Upper News Watershed Protection Program to help purchase an easement on the farm and then um, enable them to secure that land at a lower cost than if it was directly on the open market. This is a, another farm in Wake County where the landowners graciously donated an easement um, to TLC on 129 acres. Um, again, uh, all kinds of different um, resources and approaches we can take to working lands easements. This is a farm that Teresa mentioned. Uh, we're still in the process of closing out this farm. Uh, to get to Evans Point, we started working on this farm back in 2018. Uh, these projects can take a long time, but again, some of those initial steps, like making sure you're enrolled in the Voluntary Agricultural District and have farm transition plans are really critical um, to helping secure either county, state, or federal funds for conservation easements. Just want to point out that um, we talk a lot about farms, but we know there's a lot of forest in um, the county as well. And most of our working lands easements protect both um, open farmland as well as forest. And, um, you know, this can be a great tool. This is actually a picture of a farm we have an easement on. And you can see when we first uh, acquired the easement, these were longleaf pine that were planted and the landowner had a real interest in seeing that not only was his land protected, but um, the trees and the long-term investment he was making in management was also protected as well. In addition, many of our working lands also have unique natural areas. Um, we do hold a few easements on um, unique uh, wildlife corridors as well as um, a few urban gardens in addition to some of our larger working lands easements. So how does it impact your land? Um, again, you can continue with an easement to farm the land, forestry, passive recreation, hunting, fishing. 
Um, and, it, and an easement can also allow for a certain number of structures, whether that's a future home site for heirs on the properties or potential for um, additional agricultural structures. You also, as a landowner, do retain the right to transfer or sell the property. Again, they're not one size fits all. Um, easements are flexible and are catered to either the funding source or the interests of the landowner or both. This is not a quick process. Um, and especially, you know, the more resources, the more funding sources you have in the project, the longer it can take. Um, in addition to some of the state and federal resources that are out there to um, purchase easements. There are also um, some federal income tax deductions uh, that can really help um, offset the cost of this, as well as um, some long-term estate tax benefits, as well as um, you know, uh, many opportunities um, to think about that long-term transition and how this might lower your potential tax liability. Evan showed this slide, so I won't stay here long, but um, just note this is a four year process. So really, if you're considering this, um, please reach out to us now. Uh, grants for the state are typically due in December, um, and then federal grants are typically due in February or so, um, but this is a long-term decision and it can take, you know, a year of discussion or so from that initial site visit um, for us really to get to a place where we could apply for funding. So I really encourage if you're even thinking about this um, to site up, set up a site visit with us and we're happy to come out and just talk about all the options that might be out there. Um, in addition to conservation easements, TLC does um, own several farm properties. This is a Christmas tree farm we helped uh, protect. Um, it also has a uh, cattle on it in uh, Southway County. In addition, we work very closely with Soil and Water as well as the Wake County Open Space Program and are happy to help to try um, landowners to navigate that process as well. Um, Marks Creek is one of our key priority areas in partnership with the county um, together, we have protected over 2,500 acres of open space in this area. And that is a combination of easements, fee simple acquisitions and um, supporting their county in their efforts to purchase land in this area as well. In addition, I wanted to touch real quickly on a new program that TLC is um, launching this year. This is our Good Ground Initiative. Uh, this is a program that um, is basically what we call a buy, conserve, sell property. We know the average age of farmers in Wake County is um, close to 60. We know a lot of farms are transitioning. We're really trying to come up with some methods um, for farmers and landowners who want to see their land stay in production um, to be able to do that, but also know that a new generation, the next generation can continue to work the land and have access to that land. Um, so the, with this program, TLC is um, working to purchase properties, um, conserve them by developing placing an easement on the property and then selling the property at a reduced value through our Good Ground Initiative um, to new and beginning farmers, especially socially disadvantaged farmers. If you're interested in this program at all, please reach out to me. Um, we are gonna have a pilot uh, uh, project this year. It's actually in Durham, but um, that we will be seeking um, farmers uh, and applications for that property. In addition, uh, in Eastern Way, we have our Williamson Preserve, which is both a nature and farm preserve. This is our first farm and nature preserve that is located to the public. It has over 15 miles of trail, but it also has six active farmers on it. Um, uh, we also have a satellite office out here uh, in an old barn restored. I'm out here several days a week. Uh, so if you want to come by and see what um, active farmland conservation can look like on the ground, definitely reach out to me. I'm more than happy to give anyone a tour of this site. 
Um, in addition, as I mentioned, it, there is an active trail mark, but we also are making land available at Williamson Preserve for new and beginning farmers. Um, we have a partnership with Wake County on site known as the Next Gen Farmer Partnership. This is one of our next gen farmers here, Newball Farms, who are um, raising registered polled Hartford cattle on the site. Our real goal of the Williamson Preserve, which is 405 acres, is that this is an education and training farm that can provide resources, not only for the farmers on site, but the entire farming community in Wake County. So that was a real brief overview of our work. Um, happy to provide more information. My contact info is here. Don't hesitate to email or um, reach out to me via phone. And I'd be happy to take a few questions if there are any. Thank you, Leanne. Some great information. Um, one of the things that stand out to me is uh, information on those easements. You know, uh, working in conservation for many years, um, you know, a lot of folks think that conservation easements are, are not flexible. Um, and so I get a lot of those questions. They think, you know, all, all the rights are gone uh, once that happens. And so I'm glad that you, you uh, stated that, that, you know, that there are things that we can work with folks on, on different uses as far as parcels uh, or areas of the uh, farm that may be for future development of a house or something like that, that could work out with conservation easements. So there are, there are some flexibilities, I guess is what I'm trying to say, when, when doing a conservation easement. So. Um, I'm glad you pointed that out, and that's important for, for farmers to remember, and I know that's a lot of the questions and concerns that they have uh, for the future generations as well, you know, and the uses on that farm. Yeah. yeah. Any questions that you see in the chat, Lauren? We don't have any right now, so. Okay, okay. Um, I'll bring up one. Um, and I know Leanne's talked about it, and uh, I know I think we still have um, Andrew on. I'm not sure if Jason's still on or not. Um, but one of the questions that I get asked frequently uh, as far as conservation easements is um, if, if in the future there was a potential kind of condemnation of farmland with a potential DOT project or anything like that, um, and, and there is a permanent conservation easement on that farm, what is the likelihood um, that that land would still be condemned for a a new road or a new project or anything in the future. I know, um, and y'all may have already answered this question, uh, you know, in, in the past, but if you could elaborate on that, because that, that seems to be a common theme, as you know, as Wake County's growing, we get population increase in the county and then infrastructure, of course, uh, has to happen uh, in the county with the increase in population density, whether it's roads or other different types of projects where land could be condemned. What does that mean for them if they do have a permanent conservation easement on that farm and, and trying to protect that from changing from an active working farm to other uses like that? I'm not sure who wants to take it, but I'm just curious if, Leanne, if you want to start or whoever feels like they, they can provide some feedback for our, our landowners. I saw Robert unmute it, so I'd be interested in his thoughts, and I'm happy to add to it. Sure, sure. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Leanne. All I would say is um, <clears throat> this is a situation that's, uh, in my experience, is already contemplated in the agreement, in the conservation easement agreement, because one thing that the, the, um, the deed of conservation easement does is it, it directly addresses, at least the, the model that I see most, most entities using, um, directly addresses that situation in terms of um, specifically how money will be, you know, allocated um, when land is taken and compensation is paid. Um, but in, this is just my view. But I, I, you have a powerful advocate um, to speak up and try to get um, the condom nor whether it's a private or a public um, entity to um, to consider other alternatives. Uh, but at the end of the day, if that's not something that's successful, technically, um, the easement itself does not stand in the way of eminent domain. The eminent domain power is the, um, the, the pr primacy. It, it has primacy over other land interests. Yeah, and we're really hoping that answer might change one day. Um, there are some protections for private utilities um, that a conservation can help 
but unfortunately there is nothing out there that can um, eliminate eminent domain and the power of a local government or authority to take land. With that said, um, some of the review documents, whether they're environmental impact statements or other um, documents that have to be taken on by DOT and other entities do take the fact that land was um, permanently conserved, um, especially if there's um, you know, public funding into that, into a consideration as they're um, looking at various routes and um, alternatives. Great, great answers both from Andrew and Leanne. Thank you. That's that one that comes up often in, in this county. And so, and hopefully, like you said, Leanne, hopefully that will change in the future because I think that would that would help a lot um, with a lot of our, our landowners as well, because they, they do have concerns over that uh, moving forward in the future with that. So um, Lauren, do you see, oh, I'm sorry, Evan, I see you, I'm yeah. sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was looking up some information there to, to supplement. Obviously what Andrew said uh, was correct. In our experiences, uh, we've seen that these impacts have been reduced uh, in these situations, and uh, especially so if there were federal funds involved with the project. So again, it's not going to protect, uh, but we have seen in reality that these types of impacts have been reduced. Another thing to keep involved in mind with this, uh, uh, you have federal and state laws and executive orders about uh, specifically prime farmland soils, uh, limiting those impacts. So I had to look those up. Uh, NEPA, which is the National Environmental Policy Act, SEPA is the state equivalent. Um, and so with, uh, it requires all federal agencies or those receiving federal funding in the case of NCDOT to consider environmental factors through a systemic interdisciplinary approach. And so they have the, the Farmland Protection Policy Act um, and so it's looking at the unnecessary and irreversible conversion of farmland. Um, and so those combined with, like we'll up here, Executive Order 96 uh, with the state. And so ensure that actions taken by those agencies will minimize, minimize the loss of prime agricultural and forest lands. And so it does require that disclosure of prime soil impacts as a part of that. So I think Again, what Andrew is saying there, uh, when you have these types of easements, when you have funding partners involved with it, combined with uh, easement holders, you have uh, important advocates uh, for the continued existence of the easement. So that's always our standard line in the short answers is it's not going to prevent it, uh, but we've seen that it has limited impacts sometimes in those scenarios. So, great news, yeah, absolutely. And and I, I notice in a lot of the farms, working a lot of the farms and the soils um, that we have in Wake, Wake County, they they are deemed you know uh, very important soils um, and nationally important soils um, for the farm and forest production as well. So with that, because I have actually looked up a lot of that and done some research on that, on, on where those soils are located within within Wake County. We have uh, kind of the map that you showed earlier, um, Evan, with those green areas. And so um, there are a lot of significant um, soils that are very, very highly productive uh, in that capacity for farms that we want to try to protect uh, long term in this county. So thank you all. Um, Lauren, one, one last um, check of any uh, questions or I open it up to any comments um, that anybody would like to make um, on, on the presentations that we've had today. I've got no new questions. Um, and just one little plug to, I think Eric's gonna put it in the chat for our video streams, but just a, a survey uh, for those in attendance, if you'd like, if you're able to fill it out and just give us some feedback on what you thought was helpful um what you like didn't like uh that would be super helpful for us going forward planning for next year uh but that's all thank you lauren we will we will that that survey is very important for us for planning and, and future topics um, we use that collect that and uh, get that information as far as what what you would like to hear from what topics are important to you uh with farm uh, landowners and so please take the time to fill that out and get that back to us I think they just put that uh, online survey in the chat. Um, so please take the time to fill that out. 
we will get that and, and record that. And um, as we're planning for, for next year's Keeping the Form workshop. Um, I would like to thank uh, at this time, the uh, Wake County Board of Commissioners, of course, um, that they have continued to support and dedicate uh, time and resources um, for our annual Keeping the Form workshop. Honestly, this would not be possible with, without their uh, support. Uh, again, a heartfelt thank you to all the presenters um, and, and I call them experts that were here today uh, with their presentations. As you can see, you know, when you're talking about these different issues that affect uh, farm and forest landowners in Wake County, um, it's very complicated. It's very difficult. And there's, there's things to consider uh, and plan for. Um, but the good news with that, that it, it is very difficult and, and that we, we have the resource professionals and experts that can help answer those questions and, and get you through that process. Um, and so that's, that's what we're here for. That's why we do this is to make sure that your interest in your land is protected and that you have the right educational and tools uh, at, at your fingertips available to you um, to help make those decisions with you and your family. Um, I, I, again, many resource professionals has gone into this. We will have that um, that comprehensive list of folks and addresses and um, emails and phone numbers on our website um, for, for you to access. Of course, you can reach out to us at any point and staff here in our office, and we'll be glad to provide you that. Um, I thank you all for attending uh, this event uh, this afternoon. Um, it's, it's been great. Uh, we look forward to hosting our 18th annual Keeping the Farm workshop in person next spring here next door at the Wake County Office Park uh, at, the, at the Commons Building. And as uh, Leanne uh, said earlier, we, I think we've all missed for the last two years the Forks Cafeteria and their wonderful lunch um, that we'll be providing uh, next year um, for this workshop too. So we look forward to seeing all your faces in person next year so that we will uh, have the opportunity to speak with these professionals um, uh, with the breakout sessions that we usually do in the afternoon, so you can work one on one with them, um, have all of them in one room to be able to to answer those questions um, and, and and give you the information that you need. So, if there's no other um, comments or questions that that Lauren tells me. I hope everyone has a, a wonderful afternoon, and we will see you next year. And don't forget all of the recorded presentations from today that will be broke out by topic. Um, so you don't have to listen to the whole presentation. Um, they will be broken out by topic on our website uh, very soon, uh, Wake County Communications Office. I know we'll be working hard on, on getting that done. So we'll let you know uh, when those presentations are available, but keep checking back to our website and uh, hopefully we'll have those on there soon for you. So with that, um, thank you all very much and we hope you have a wonderful afternoon.